Good morning, everyone. Uh, today is uh, July 9th, 2020. This is a joint hearing of the Judiciary and Public Safety and Finance Committees uh, and the Senate Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, today's agenda is the uh, state role in responding to the riots that occurred in uh, the metropolitan area between May 26th, 2020 and June 10th, 2020. The, uh, we've got a short video presentation that we are going to, uh, to have. And after that, I will uh, invite uh, General Jensen to come to the uh, testifying table. Commissioner Harrington uh, is invited to be here uh, this afternoon. It would be our intention to take a short recess uh, after we complete any questions that we have of General Jensen. So with that, Mr. Walsh, if you would uh, roll the video, please. Now around 6 p.m., the protest turned into a march towards the third precinct where it is believed that the officers worked. A much smaller group than the initial protest started vandalizing the building, shattering a window, spray painting squad cars and the side of the building. Officers then showed up in riot gear and started firing tear gas and flashbangs, which you can hear going off right now. As uh, many protesters were hurling rocks, water bottles, anything they could get their hands on towards the officers. The unruly crowd measured in hundreds, a far cry from the peaceful group that started the protest. I'm wondering, uh, what are you telling your officers right now? Because uh, it appears that there is no police presence at the Target, for example, or the Auto Zone or the liquor store, several of these areas that have been looted. We certainly hear your point. There are many more peaceful protesters than looters. However, this is very real and happening right now. So what's the plan as far as the police are concerned? Right, right now, our, our uh, main priority for our officers there uh, are, are the, the safety of, of those who are out there. So we do have uh, we do have peaceful protesters who, uh, just by the dynamics, are in the middle or in the mix with those who are, are causing um, some of this uh, um, um, destruction.
I just want to put a call out. I, I don't know if any of the mayors or the governor or any chiefs are listening right now, but uh, I feel the city, the state needs to, need hear to hear from our leaders. Yes. We need to hear from you. We are in complete chaos in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Please call in. Please respond to the questions that your citizens are asking of you. Why were these decisions made? What is the plan? People are getting incredibly scared, and I know everybody watching tonight, we all understand what this stemmed from. We do not want to downplay that. There are some really big issues we need to deal with. This is a very clear message being sent by a lot of people. Uh, and, and at the same time, this is now devolving into a situation where people are not safe. And we want you to know at home, we have tried. We are trying to get people on the phone, the decision makers, to explain the thought behind this and to explain what the plan is. We also understand, as AJ said, in St. Paul, for example, they are stretched incredibly thin. I mean, these looters, they're hitting every area they can as quickly as they can. Here's the tweet now, Randy, if you want to. From the city of Minneapolis, Minneapolis, it says we're hearing unconfirmed reports that gas lines to the third precinct have been cut and other explosive materials are in the building. If you are near the building for your safety, please retreat in the event the building explodes. Well, let's just leave that up for a minute and let that sink in. That's officially coming from the city of Minneapolis, that there could be big explosions. And we know people are down there near the building. I, I don't know how those people are going to get this message. I, 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 this is just outrageous. This is an outrageous night. The official protest started around 5 p.m., where organizers applauded the firing of those four Minneapolis police officers involved in the incident, but they called on the city attorney to arrest and charge those officers. As the protest grew, it moved down to the Minneapolis Police 3rd Precinct about two miles away, and that's where things started to get more violent. That's where we saw people throwing rocks at police cars, at the precinct building, people spray painting police cars. That's also when the rain really started coming down and we saw a lot of people leaving. Before all of that escalation though, we did talk to protesters about why they came to South Minneapolis to demonstrate. Hey, we got Jackie Chan in this bitch. Hey, 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 hey. Are you gonna ask the governor's help with the National Guard? Uh, yes. Uh, I have made that phone call to the governor and uh, has been requested. And what was a response back from him? The governor uh, and the state have been have been very helpful. Okay. Uh, but I would further direct that that, that uh, I, I believe they'll be uh, in contact shortly. Last Wednesday night, as the target near the 3rd Precinct was being looted, the mayor got an urgent call from Police Chief Madaria Arredondo. And he said, Mayor, uh, if, this con if this continues, I do not think there is any way that our police department is going to be able to handle this crisis on our own. Mayor, I'm asking you to ask for the National Guard. Fry says he immediately asked the governor for the National Guard, but they weren't out in full force until Saturday. I think what you expected me to do is to be there is we were in a support role as state law shows and once it became apparent to me that the city of Minneapolis would not be able to complete that, I was directing uh, 
the state to take that over. But I think in the moment of making sure as those decisions were being made and that we were staying in the lane that we were asked to support this and as it deteriorated, it was at 1205. There was a decision last night uh, that we made is to come in front of you at that time because that was the transition point because what you're seeing now is the state is the lead element now starting at 1205 last night and those first missions that were carried out. Uh, there were millions of Americans and Minnesotans certainly watching on their TV screens as this unfolded last night there was almost a complete lack of visibility of local police, state police, National Guard. After much fanfare about how the National Guard was coming in, people watched buildings burn, public and private. How could there not have been a clear mission for the National Guard when this, when they were called in and you knew things were going to happen last night? Yeah, I will let my leadership come back up there. Uh, you're absolutely right, and I think uh, that speaks to itself that by uh, by shortly after 10 o'clock, it became apparent that that structure would go. The way this works is, is the mayors ask and they take charge and lead on the missions. Uh, I'll let the folks come up here said, I, I see that too. I think the decision to made to not engage. And I want to just be clear, there's, there's philosophically an argument to be made that an armed presence on the ground in the midst of where we just had a police killing is seen as a catalyst. My point to that was is we don't need a catalyst. It's already burning. And so this is trying to strike that balance. And so I am in total agreement with that. You will not see that tonight. There will be no lack of leadership and there will be no lack of response on the table. Follow up. Should there have been a National Guard presence on every corner in those areas last night as a deterrent, as opposed to having them come in? As well, I would ask and I'll, I'll answer this one uh, potentially, but the, the decision on that as it's made from the city and on this one, I, I think I would agree with them. We saw the first night decisions were made. Up until about 8.30 last evening, it appeared that things were relatively peaceful on that. There was a decision during the day whether did you occupy the entire city and shut it down after those 24 hours. In retrospect, um, I, I'm assuming that yes, we would say that. But at the time, and again, we will not know it because proving the negative, would it have simply started those uh, that movement faster and would we've seen it moved out of the third precinct? But yes, yeah, certainly, that's a, it's a valid uh, critique and point. Yes? Governor. You know, there was uncontrolled looting in St. Paul yesterday afternoon, and you're talking about making decisions at 10 o'clock. Why are you making the decisions then and not coming up with these scenarios as these things are happening just up the street from where The leadership started? of communities is led by local leadership, their police force. They were at that time had sources in reserve. They were not being requested. They were not being requested. And I'm on with them. The reason we're standing here today is if this would have been executed correctly, the state would not lead on this. The state would have supported those and they would have moved forward. That did not happen. So now today we're taking that. We're making the decision to go and do it moving forward. And again, I would go back to Tom's question. Had I known that we were not going to see that or the capability to do it, should the state have come in? Potentially, but I want to be very clear. This, with the exception of the state troopers who have a very specific uh, statutory requirement on the highways, order is to the local police and sheriffs. We do not have a built-in police force. General Jensen is not a police force. DPS has experts in there, but these are not the police force that are on their streets with their people. And so that's a decision that uh, was made. It was in reserve, and, and, and yes, keeping in mind as this unfolded, the request came from St. Paul for the Guard to be activated at five. I had moved on a warning order earlier than that to be prepared. You're really supposed to wait until you get that and start moving them in. That wasn't going to be possible. So by five o'clock yesterday, our guard troops were coming from all over. They were getting activated because of the events that happened the night before, and we were prepared to carry out those missions. And we were, they were, they were there. And as you heard, some of these folks think those missions never came. Thanks for joining us. We begin right now with breaking news in Minneapolis. As you can see, a group of rioters, protesters, fire cars on fire. This is in the 5th Precinct area of Minneapolis along Lake Street. And uh, this is just uh, happening just in the last few minutes. We've been able to uh, see these pictures coming in from this part of Minneapolis. Yeah, we've been following the situation, which had remained fairly peaceful throughout the night. A lot of people disregarding the curfew, but not a lot of right. violence or fires breaking out at that point. Uh, unfortunately, it appears that is possibly about to happen right now in the 5th Precinct, just down the street from the 3rd Precinct that was decimated last night.
um, the National Guard, which is behind State Patrol. You can see them on top of the uh, campers up there. And then maybe about 100 officers um, from Minnesota right in front are asking, telling people, really demanding that people push back. They march and they say, move forward, move forward. Um, and then we hear on the loudspeaker that you are in violation for, uh, for um, assembling in an unlawful place right now. They are trying to push people out of this area near the third precinct. The third precinct, for reference, is just maybe about, what would you say, about two, three blocks um, west uh, down Lake Street where we are right now. So they're blocking that off just about uh, 10 minutes or so ago. We were live. Um, basically, if you make an L shape, go down straight where you're looking and then we were live uh, down a block. And we were also starting to see officers, although not to this scale, pushing people back. And State Patrol has pulled up here at Franklin Avenue and Nicollet. I'm not sure what they're doing, but they're getting out of their vehicles. Uh, the officers appear to be in riot gear. Here, let's carefully get a little bit closer, and they're dispersing the crowd, uh, or at least people are starting oh, to run yeah. out of fear of what may occur. State troopers have gotten out of their vehicles. Uh, it, it appears as though they're trying to prevent this march from all oh, tear gas has started. Again, we are at the intersection of Franklin and Nicollet, just south of downtown, and State Patrol came flying in uh, west down Franklin, cutting this march off in half. And now they've, they've effectively prevented this march from going any further. It's been split into two. Uh, they're holding the line. Look how quickly they got into formation and caused this group to scatter. The people that were in that immediately in, immediate intersection uh, were met with flashbangs and tear gas. And now this whole entire situation has been fractured right in the center. Okay, we have uh, National Guards members pointing. So right now we are here at Precinct 2, Minneapolis Police, Precinct 2, this is in Northeast Minneapolis, and just about two minutes ago, National Guard troops started to roll in. You can see the line here with their heavily armored vehicles coming on in and equipment, um, and it just keeps coming. And you can see that they've already built this huge barrier around the police precinct here. So far, we really haven't seen destruction of a mass extent in this neighborhood or at this police precinct, but clearly they are ready for it tonight here in Northeast Minneapolis. Just take a look at the number of National Guard troops coming in here to apparently guard this police station. Again, this is Minneapolis Police Precinct 2 in Northeast Minneapolis. making sure my phone was uh, was turned off. Um, uh, just for the benefit of the members, uh, we do have uh, Colonel Langer uh, is in attendance uh, and uh, he would be available for any questions that the, uh, the members may have once we get to member questions. Uh, we also have uh, here this morning uh, Major General John Jensen and with him is his Chief of Staff Colonel Simon Schaefer. Uh, at this time, I would call uh, General Jensen forward, and uh, uh, General, it's completely up to you as to whether or not you wish uh, Colonel, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Colonel Schaefer to come to the table with you. Completely up to you. You're, it, it's your call. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw a lifeline back there if I, if I need him. Well, thank you very much for coming in uh, to uh, visit with us this morning. We are looking forward to your testimony. Uh, and to begin with, just for the record, if you would identify yourself, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Major General John A. Jensen. I'm the Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard and the Commissioner of uh, the Department of Military Affairs. I've been the Adjutant General since November 1st, 2017. Thank you, General. And uh, is my understanding you have a, a short statement that you wish to make before we uh, go to questions. Is that correct? Yes, it is, Mr. Chair. General Jensen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to, uh, with you today. I know you have a lot of questions uh, this morning, so I'll be brief in my opening comments. The period of 28 May to 9 June marks an unprecedented deployment of the Minnesota National Guard in support of law enforcement agencies. 
Over 7,100 soldiers and airmen of the Minnesota Guard were ultimately deployed in support of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and surrounding cities and counties to include Clay County as well. This type of deployment of the Minnesota National Guard is rare. In the past 86 years, there have been five similar deployments of the Minnesota National Guard, and they include 1934 labor strike where 3,500 guardsmen uh, were called in uh, here in Hennepin County, 1967 civil unrest, 806 soldiers, 1972 demonstrations and protests in Dinkytown, 800 soldiers responded to that, 1979 labor unrest, uh, over 5,600 soldiers were called through uh, multiple locations, in 1986 uh, laborers were at unrest in Austin, uh, 1,000 soldiers of the Minnesota National Guard uh, were called. Response to civil unrest is an extremely complicated mission for everybody involved, law enforcement and National Guard alike. The complexity and potential for loss of life and property are extremely high, and the decision-making cycle is extremely compressed. While supporting law enforcement agencies in this role, I am cognizant that the decisions and actions of every soldier and airman have the potential to save lives and take lives. In this regard, the soldiers and airmen of the Minnesota National Guard responded admirably. The process to request National Guard resources and our planned response times are laid out as part of the Minnesota Emergency Operations Plan. The MEOP, as it's called, is a well-communicated state plan that encompasses all state agencies and describes state response to emergencies. This plan is the cornerstone of any state response, understanding that every scenario is different and not every contingency can be planned for. The Minnesota National Guard met all timelines associated with this plan and in many cases were more responsive than the MEOP lays out. The responsiveness of the Minnesota National Guard is a, tri is a tribute to the commitment and dedication of the soldiers and airmen that make up our units. I heard story after story of our great soldiers and airmen leaving their places of employment and their families within a moment's notice to respond and doing so in a very uncertain environment due to COVID-19. As I've stated before, the Minnesota National Guard is not a law enforcement agency. We are a military force that has a dual mission, which includes supporting the citizens of this great state. This support, this support can be as diverse as responding to avian flu, responding to floods, winter storm response, wildfire suppression, and COVID-19 testing. When you consider the diversity of our state responses and consider our federal mission requirements, I offer that no other agency is more flexible and adaptable than the men and women of your National Guard. In support of the MEOP and local incident commanders, the Minnesota National Guard is always a supporting agency and never the lead agency. Those who suggest that the Minnesota National Guard should have unilaterally moved into Minneapolis or St. Paul are advocating for martial law. For law and uh, for, uh, for martial law, as that is the only legal means for the Minnesota National Guard to become legally responsible for law enforcement activities. I believe martial law was last declared by a Minnesota governor in 1959 in Freeborn County. The constitutional premise of military subordination to civil authority is a foundational principle of our nation and a principle that those of us that wear the United States military uniform hold dearly. I won't go through our entire timeline today, but I would like to highlight a few key items. Thursday, 28 May, within five hours of our initial notification, our first unit arrives at Arden Hills and begins preparation for tasking. This is well ahead of the four to eight hour timeline that we use for mustering and beginning movement from their armory as it's laid out in the MEOP. Within seven hours of notification on Thursday morning, May 28th, we had 183 soldiers staged for tasking, and by the end of the evening, we had 451 personnel in direct support of law enforcement or supporting the mobilization of soldiers and airmen at Arden Hills. By the end of Friday, 29 May, we had uh, over 711 soldiers and airmen supporting operations or in the process of mobilizing. By the end of Saturday, 30 May, we had 4,500 personnel on duty. Sunday, 30 May, we ended up with 7,123 personnel on duty. We ultimately provided support to over 60 locations across the Twin Cities between 28 May and 9 June and provided over 43,000 man days of support. Finally, any failings of the Minnesota National Guard in regards to our response are mine alone. I'm exceptionally proud 
of how our National Guard responded to this event, and I'm exceptionally proud of how our soldiers and airmen performed their assigned task. Their ability to transition from their civilian role and into their soldier airman role is, is amazing and should give everyone confidence that your Minnesota National Guard is prepared to meet the needs of our state and citizens. Thank you very much, and I stand by for your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, first question I have is uh, if you would talk a little bit more about MEOP, uh, uh, how it is uh, prepared specifically with, with respect to riot control. Uh, so the, the MEOP belongs to uh, Homeland Security or Emergency Management, a subsection of the Department of, of Public Safety. And so, uh, in accordance with the national framework, uh, what it lays out for each state agency, uh, based on uh, prescribed emergencies, uh, what our role is to support that, whether you're a lead agency, whether you're a supporting agency, and generally what tasks that you would, would be uh, assigned uh, with that. As it relates to our tasks, uh, again, in a supporting role, we're tasked with things, uh, for example, traffic control points, uh, uh, presence patrols, site security, critical, uh, critical uh, infrastructure security, and those types of uh, tasks in support of uh, law enforcement. Also, there are a few um, general tasks that go to very specific uh, organizations of the Minnesota National Guard. For example, the 55th Civil Support Team, which is our uh, uh, chemical uh, biological uh, response team uh, are listed in there. And, and it goes down by, by uh, particular incident uh, and by agency, if you have a role. In general, uh, insofar as this uh, uh, MEOP is concerned, uh, in your opening statement, you indicated that the response times are laid out as part of the uh, of MEOP. Um, uh, who has the authority in the state of Minnesota to initiate uh, MEOP and calling the guard out? So uh, actually calling the guard out, uh, that authority resides with the governor. Requesting National Guard support resides in, uh, in most cases, the county sheriff, who is the senior emergency management official of the county. There are four exceptions to that. The mayors of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, and Duluth uh, also have that authority uh, as mayors of uh, cities of the first class. But traditionally, what we see is that it's the, uh, the county mayor, and, but in the, with those four exceptions, it can be uh, the city mayor. I'm sorry, uh, county sheriff, not county mayor. So in, in incident response and emergency response, the theory is uh, all resources go to the incident commander, the local incident commander. So the, the appointed authority makes a request for the National Guard. It enters then into HSCM. Uh, to one of their staff duty officers. In this case, it went into the state EOC because the state EOC was already stood up for COVID-19. Normally, the state EOC is, is, an, is an operational. Uh, it, it enters into the state EOC. The commissioner of public safety, the director of HSCM, and myself then have a conversation about the request, and then we go to the governor and we make a request or I'm sorry, we make a, a recommendation of the governor. Governor, we, uh, we recommend we accept this mission. Uh, we recommend we don't. We don't always accept missions. And let me give you an example of when we did not accept a mission. The concept of the use of the guard is we are the last force that's brought in. Uh, typically what you are asked to do if there's an emergency that, that exceeds the local uh, incident commander's capabilities, that, we, uh, that they request through mutual aid resources in and around that, uh, uh, that uh, location. So it can be other law enforcement agencies, it can be uh, uh, other county agencies, it can be other cities' uh, uh, forces. An example of that would be Super Bowl 52, where we had a very large number of uh, law enforcement agencies outside of Minneapolis that, and Hennepin County that supported that. So er, early on in the COVID-19 response, uh, some of our long-term care facilities were having staffing challenges. And we started getting direct requests 
from uh, these facilities into the state EOC requesting that the National Guard come in and solve staffing um, shortfalls in long-term care facilities. Well, the, the immediate response uh, from Director Kelly and I was no, the, the long-term care facilities needed to, f to go to other sources first. It wasn't until every other source had been exhausted would the National Guard be utilized. And so that's, that's one of the reasons uh, why the director, I'm sorry, the Commissioner of Public Safety, the director of HSEM, and myself uh, review all of those requests. Because what we want to do is go to the governor when we do ask, for National Guard support, that we can answer that question, has all other, all other resources been exhausted? In the case of the Minneapolis riots that uh, I'll, I'll say between May 26th and say June 10th, um, uh, who was, uh, in your opinion, the local incident commander that you were dealing with? Uh, so my, my first... Um, notification that the guard may be utilized was Wednesday evening uh, at uh, about 7.38 p.m. I had a phone call with uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety, Commissioner Harrington. He called me and he indicated that uh, on Saturday there was a loud, a large protest up to 75,000 people that was scheduled for Saturday and that his assessment was that the city of Minneapolis was going to need uh, assistance. And uh, he asked me, you know, what could you have available Saturday? And not knowing the exact particulars of the event, not having any tasks, what I responded was that I could have 200 soldiers available, my two military police companies available uh, by Saturday. Now this is, this is leaning a little bit far forward because to my knowledge on, on Wednesday night, we don't have a request from an incident commander or from a, an emergency manager. It's Commissioner Harrington kind of looking into the future, believing that uh, he sees that there, there, might, there might be uh, an issue. So Wednesday night, uh, when I get off the phone, what I have agreed with uh, Commissioner Harrington uh, is that Thursday morning, we would we would begin notifying soldiers of a potential mobilization because I knew that what we needed to do was sit down uh, in a phone conference or, or or physically and really discuss exactly what we were going to need. Because while I said 200, that might have been too many or it might not have been enough. We just didn't know based on on the data that we had. Um, so. The initial concept that I briefed the Commissioner Harrington was that we would begin notifying on Thursday. We would mobilize and bring our soldiers on duty on Friday. And then on Saturday, we would deploy to the event. Um, went to bed uh, Wednesday night, woke up Thursday morning to a, a text from Commissioner Harrington. I believe it was at uh, 6.35 a.m. Uh, Thursday morning saying, hey, we're going to need to accelerate the use of the guard based on last night's events. And and, and I agreed uh, with him on that. Again, at this point, we are still in the planning stage. We are, we are beginning at the, the notification stage. But uh, at this point, I don't have uh, verbal or written uh, approval from the governor yet. That comes a little bit later uh, in the morning through uh, through Commissioner Harrington, and uh, we we begin the mobilization of the guard then on on Thursday morning. But as of 6:30 on Thursday, uh, the May 28th, you had not yet had a request from a local incident commander. Is that correct? Uh, th that's correct, and that's why initially when we uh, went into Thursday morning, what what my idea was is that we were accelerating Saturday's plan. Uh, Saturday's plan, 200 soldiers out of our two MP companies in support of a, a, of a large uh, demonstration. Uh, that's why Thursday morning, I'm not looking at bringing 500 soldiers on or 1,000 soldiers or 2,000. Uh, at this point, there's not a request for me to respond to. Um, my understanding from looking at news clips, et cetera, uh, that on Thursday, Mayor Fry. Uh, had indicated he was going to ask the National uh, Guard for assistance. Uh, uh, did he, in fact, contact you, Mayor Fry, contact you on uh, Thursday 
uh, May 28th requesting assistance? Uh, no, we didn't. But but I have never, ever been called by an emergency manager directly with a request. It always goes either through uh, Department of Public Safety or into HSCM. So uh, I have never been called by any emergency manager. Okay, uh, fair uh, enough. Uh, at, at any point uh, during that week, did you feel that you were dealing with a local incident commander or was all of your dealings through Commissioner Harrington? Uh, it would be Friday, I believe, at noon when the uh, multi-agency coordination center is set up. And uh, at that point, that becomes the touch point for the incident commander. And so um, prior, uh, prior to Friday at noon, uh, I, I feel like I am responding to uh, the mayor of St. Paul and the mayor of uh, Minneapolis. Uh, primarily, though, through the state EOC, uh, and not and not directly. And uh, you know, as I look back and, and 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 say, you know, how could we have been better? What could we have done better? I mean, this certainly is one thing that that I look back as it relates to myself, is that uh, I, I certainly could have worked harder to get. Minneapolis to understand what I needed to get from them in order for me to understand what they needed so we could give them what they thought that they, they needed. And it's not uncommon for us to get a request. For example, I need 500 guardsmen. My question always is immediately to do what? Uh, and so it's not uncommon to get a uh, um, part of a request and not the full request that, that, that we need. Uh, for example, if you want me to do uh, a particular mission, is it a 24-hour-a-day mission or is it a 12-hour-a-day mission? Because if you ask for 50 and you and our assessment's 50, but you need us for 24 hours a day, that's really 100. And so that's why, that's why we have to work through everything in excruciating detail. Uh, because what I want to give is I want to give our emergency managers and, and our county sheriffs and our mayors what they need to be successful. But without knowing exactly what the tasks are, what the duration of the task, uh, I'm unable to do that. In addition, I'm also not able to set my soldiers and airmen up for success. For example... General, uh, did, yeah. by Friday at noon, did you have that necessary information? Uh, I believe it is Friday by about 1,500 is when I get, for the first time, a list of priorities as it relates to missions uh, in Minneapolis and, and St. Paul. And so this allows me to take my force and, and begin getting them towards, towards the priorities. Not every mission was in enough detail for us to immediately go support. In many cases, we're lacking you know, what's the exact location you need us to be? Who's your point of contact so we can begin working through uh, all, of, all of these measures? Where would that source of in information come from that would well, what enable we, you to, yeah. to complete your mission? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, that would normally come from uh, the entity that we are, we are in, in, in support. Uh, by Friday, though, again, because the, the MAC has now been established, what we're able to do is go back into the MAC where there are liaison officers from every agency that's supporting the incident and go back and, and start flushing out more and more of those uh, details. In this case, uh, the Minneapolis riots, was the entity that you were dealing with then the Department of S uh, Public Safety? Uh, it, so the, the Department of Public Safety stood up the MAC uh, and, and, and had the lead in the MAC, but every law enforcement agency or in every agency that was supporting Minneapolis and St. Paul were represented there. For example, I had two individuals there 24-7 that were our liaisons. So as other agencies had questions for us, we could answer those as well as us uh, having the ability to coordinate with other agencies. Uh, ultimately, am I correct, General, that uh, it would take an order from the governor in order to actually activate the guard? Yes, that's exactly right. It's an, it's an executive order. Uh, and the executive order that Governor Walls uh, lays, lays out, which is very common, uh, what you'll see is that there's not a numbers cap. Uh, it really gives me the discretion 
uh, to bring on as many guardsmen as needed to accomplish the mission. And so that's what you see in Governor Walz's uh, executive order that I believe is published uh, late afternoon on Thursday. So late afternoon Thursday is when you received orders from the governor to activate the guard. That's when I received the executive order. We've been working on it all day long. Uh, the executive order, as you can, as, as we all know, it's got to go through several layers of lawyers to be reviewed to make sure that it's uh, legally um, uh, correct and those type of things. And so we knew the executive order was coming uh, for Minneapolis and St. Paul. And then there was a discussion about how much of the surrounding area needed to be included in that. What's the language sound like? And that's, you know, I allow other people to, uh, to work that thing. I felt, I felt very early uh, Thursday morning that I had the, the go ahead from the governor to be, begin bringing on the guard. So uh, by Thursday morning, you knew it was going to happen later on Thursday then. You got the official go ahead. Yes, Mr. that's Chair? correct, Mr. Chair. That is correct. All right. Thank you, General. Uh, I'm now going to go to uh, member questions. Senator Lang. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, sir. It's very happy to have you here this morning. Thank you. Um, I wrote down on my little note I was going to tell you to thank you for coming, but I, I think uh, a little more thank you is due. Um, a uh, great debt of gratitude, really, from the state of Minnesota, and, and I'd like to, you know, forward that on to the Minnesota Guard and soldiers and airmen of the Minnesota Guard and all the people that that uh, came together and showed a great deal of professionalism uh, on your own behalf, uh, on their behalf, and, and really uh, goes to show you what a well-trained group of individuals can accomplish when they're assigned to do so. Um, I know it's outside the wheelhouse of the Minnesota Guard to to do law enforcement. I mean, you, you said it in your, in your statement yourself. Um, I, I know that uh, in, in tough times that the Minnesota Guard has often been the shining star, and it, and it sure was over that uh, the course of, you know, a very sad uh, time frame for the state of Minnesota. So first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for the work you did, and thanks to the soldiers and, and airmen that did the work as well. So. Thank you. Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, thank, thank you very much uh, for that. I, I, I appreciate it. And, and while I, I accept the compliments, I, I just remind everybody uh, that, that we were just a part of a, a much bigger team that, that really contributed uh, ultimately to uh, success. But, but thank you very much, Senator. Senator Lang. Um, I, I think, you, actually, Mr. Chairman, you've answered several of the questions I was going to lead off with. But I, I'm just going to start from the beginning and, and go from there, sir. Um, so the, the, the official that is in charge of the National Guard from the state of Minnesota, oftentimes I, I, I find as a guardsman that I have trouble explaining exactly what the state, the, the civilian to military relationship is. And yours in particular with the Department of Public Safety, the governor's office, and, and civilian agencies is oftentimes confusing. And I think that even us around the table have a, a tough time explaining exactly how that works. Um, so if you could, just in, in real layman's terms, lay it out. How, how do you deal with the Department of Public Safety? How do you deal with the governor's office? What is a, a, a normal week prior to, you know, leading up to the events of uh, the, that why we're here today? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, I don't know that I can describe a normal week since about the 13th of March. Uh, it has been very abnormal. Um, Generally, uh, we're lucky here in Minnesota. We don't have a lot of of crisis going on. So I'll, I'll go I'll go pre-COVID. Uh, my my interaction with uh, the the Commissioner of Public Safety is cabinet meetings uh, and special occasions. Um, I, de I really deal a, a little bit more with the uh, direct or yeah the director of HSCM than I do the the Commissioner of Public Safety. But because of COVID-19, uh, we've been, you know, all of the agencies that have been supporting that effort have, have spent a lot more time together, not physically together, but on the phone and in conferences and, and, those, and those type of things. But I will tell you that my, uh, my relationship with the, the Commissioner of Public Safety is exactly the same relationship that I have with the Commissioner of Public Health right now, or the Department of Health. And that is, I'm a, I'm a supporting agency to, to their effort. I, uh, I don't work for them, 
but I want them to be successful. And within the capabilities of the Minnesota National Guard, if I'm going to do everything that we can to help them uh, be successful. And, and, and Senator, I think you would agree with this. Uh, the one great thing about being in the military is you're used to working for other people, right? And, and, and you're used to uh, ensuring that, that, that other teams are successful because our, our success are dependent on the units to the left, to the right, in front of us and behind us to be successful. Uh, so I think it comes naturally for uh, a military person to come in uh, especially in very complex situations, COVID-19, very complex situation. The avian flu uh, issue that we had a couple uh, years ago in our, our uh, uh, poultry industry. Uh, the ability to come in and very quickly add value, I think, is a, is, a, is a strength of the Minnesota National Guard. And being able to do that without trying to be the main effort. Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So. Uh, Sir, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the timeline again because I was trying to write notes as you were talking and I appreciate the, the openness with that. Um, let's just reiterate, when, during that timeline, when were you first contacted to, to mobilize the Guard and how exactly did that happen? John, On John. Wednesday evening, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, um, uh, Wednesday evening, uh, the 27th of May, at 19.38 hours or 7.38 p.m., Commissioner John Harrington, the Commissioner of Public Safety, called me and we had an approximate five minute phone call. And he asked uh, what I could have available uh, to support law enforcement agencies on Saturday, uh, which would have been the 30th of May, as they were expecting 75,000 protesters to come to the Twin Cities. Uh, that's the first time that I had uh, any contact as it relates to mobilizing the Guard in support of uh, civil unrest. Senator Lang. I, I guess uh, my, my question in general is, oftentimes in the military, you don't do anything without orders. Um, and those orders come in one way. How, when did you first receive your first set of written orders? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Lang, once the first time I received my... First set of written orders. Oh, written orders. Um, well... Or was, here, was there a... a, a, a Senator Lang. A Warno prior to that? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, so the... You know, there are cultural differences between police forces and the military. Doesn't make one of us better than the other. Uh, it just is cultural differences. Uh, Senator, based on uh, your military experience, you know that we like to have a written product. We like to have a written uh, order, uh, even if it's just a, 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 an email. What I have learned in, in my time as the Adjutant General and then previously is that police departments don't necessarily work that same way. Uh, they, they are much uh, quicker, uh, in part because they spend much more time in crisis action, I believe. Uh, they work, uh, they're comfortable working off a phone call uh, versus uh, what we are. So I would say that uh, the first written order I received would have been the governor's executive order on Thursday afternoon. Uh, as it relates to a written order in response to civil unrest, I will tell you that will be Friday morning at approximately 0200, where the, uh, under the leadership of Commissioner Harrington, the State Patrol and other law enforcement agencies go back down to Lake Street to move people off of uh, Lake Street after, after uh, the third, third precinct falls. That would be the first written one that I received. Senator Lang. The first written order, sir, uh, were there specific orders how to, what the mission was, what the mission, how do you accomplish that mission? Uh, the, the typical things that we would look for in the military, were they, or is that something again where the, the, the line between civilian and military experience oftentimes is blurred and you didn't get that specific? In, and I know you kind of mentioned the fact that you were looking, helping them help you and trying to realize exactly what you needed to be successful in what you were going to do. General Jensen. Ms. Chair, Senator Lang. Um, we have, in, in the Army, we have a doctrine that will lay out 
how we communicate to each other as it relates to uh, military taskings. Uh, to my knowledge, there is not a unified police doctrine that does, does the similar thing. So that's why um, working this out with the agency that you're going to be supporting, the law enforcement agency that you're going to be uh, supporting, takes time uh, because it's typically, you know, phone calls or in-person coordination, and it's, it's not a, a written product there. To my knowledge, there's no such thing as commander's intent, uh, you know, in, in law enforcement as it relates to a, a written product like we would be uh, used to. Uh, but that being said, I was very comfortable with the plan that was developed for that early Friday uh, morning uh, Commissioner Harrington and uh, Colonel Langer put together. Um, and, you know, we were able to participate in that process as, as part of that. And I felt that we understood our task uh, and we could support our task. And I think at the uh, end of that morning, you see we're, we're very successful. So it leads me to believe that, uh, that uh, the necessary communication was, was accomplished. Senator Lang. Uh, so, sir, the, the level of buildup from the National Guard standpoint was rapid. Um, you talked about 200 soldiers that came from an, a couple of different MP companies that would possibly be available for Saturday. We went well above and beyond that in a, in a rapid fashion. Could you speak to just how rapidly that buildup was? And at, at what point in time did you reach, uh, the, you mentioned some, uh, some troop levels within, within your, I said over 71 soldiers, but from that 200 initially talked about, what was the rapid buildup? How did those decisions get made? Uh, was that a recommendation from your office to the governor and the commissioner of public safety? Was it something where the situation just demanded that and the guard made the decisions? Uh, if you could. General Jensen. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang. Um, as, as we all watched uh, the events uh, uh, unfold late Thursday night uh, as it relates to the third precinct, uh, it immediately occurred to me that right 200 wasn't going to be enough and um, Colonel Schaefer my chief of staff who's again here with me this morning uh, between him myself and the uh, senior operations officer of the Minnesota National Guard uh, Lieutenant Colonel Scott Rowweeder we began saying okay we're gonna we're gonna need more what's next on the list what's next on the list any given year, we have approximately 700 soldiers and airmen that are actually trained on civil disturbance. This is not a core task of the Army or the Air Force, but we know that, again, as I, as I laid out, uh, there have been occasions over the last 86 years where we've needed this capability. So we train about 700 soldiers in a given year to respond for this particular mission. We can use them for other things, but they receive specific civil disturbance training. Uh, so it became apparent uh, very late Thursday night that we're going to need all 700 of those. And, and the actual number ultimately is a little bit less of, of actually uh, trained people that we bring in. And, uh, and so why did, you know, why was 700, you know, the number that we picked? Well, 700 is roughly the size of the Minneapolis Police Department. It's a little bit smaller. It's a little bit larger, I believe, than the St. Paul Police Department. And it's a little bit bigger than the State Patrol. Uh, so 700 seemed to be about the right number because that's what I had trained. Right? And again, civil disturbance, civil unrest is a very complex mission, especially when you begin arming your soldiers and airmen and giving them ammunition. So uh, as bad as Thursday night uh, was, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't quite comfortable with going to the governor and saying, hey, let's bring on uh, less trained uh, soldiers. And when I looked at the numbers, I, I felt like I was adding, you know, uh, the equivalent of the Minneapolis or the St. Paul Police Department to that, to that scenario. So, um, but that was done in conversation of uh, uh, the, the three officers here and, and understanding that there is a lag time uh, to, to, to bring people in. So I believe, uh, if, I, if I remember right, it's about 0, 0100 uh, Friday morning when we begin the next set of notifications. Senator Lang. Um, how, 
I guess the, it's going to be probably a two-part question, sir, is, is how long does it typically take to mobilize, and this is going to be a strange way to, to word this, but you had 7,000 soldiers that were activated. How long would you typically say that it would take to activate 7,000 soldiers? General Jensen. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, um, we now have an answer to that question because we've now done it. We didn't have an answer to that question before. There was no contingency plan for the Minnesota National Guard to mobilize 7,123 soldiers and airmen. Our contingency plan was for roughly 700. And 700, in our mind, takes approximately 36 hours to get those 700 soldiers and airmen to their armories or their base and prepared to leave, not on the ground, but prepared to leave and go to the incident. Now, we have a couple smaller formations, uh, what we call quick reaction force, uh, that we have a shorter timeline on them. Uh, and they're, they're a smaller force. Their timeline is, is somewhere between four to eight hours to be prepared to move from their armory then into, uh, into an incident site. So when, when I laid out 200, uh, I, I felt very confident uh, that we could have 200 soldiers uh, or airmen on duty uh, by early to late afternoon on Thursday, uh, the 28th. When, when we began notifying and building to 700 uh, early Friday morning, my goal was to get to 700 uh, by Thursday evening. Uh, I'm sorry, Friday evening, the 29th. Um, my goal all along was not to try to deploy soldiers and airmen into Minneapolis or St. Paul at night. I wanted them to get on the ground during the day where they could become familiar with their environment. Where if something bad happened, they knew that I had an alternate route in this direction and an alternate route in this direction. Where was the law enforcement that's supporting our operations? Where are they located? You know, get familiar with all of that. So my goal was to get us to 700 uh, by Friday, uh, Friday evening. So as we went out on our missions, uh, we didn't have to do that uh, under the cover of darkness. And then to your question is, you know, to 7,000. Uh, if you start really early on Thursday morning, you can get there by, by Sunday. That's what we've learned. So I have two more questions, and then I'll be done, Mr. Chair. Senator Lang. Um, you mentioned the 700 on Thursday, the, the threat assessment or the, the process that your office went through, and relationship with the governor's office and DPS, 700 by Thursday. Between that 700 and the 7,000 on Sunday, what changed? What was the big indicator? What, what in your mind, cause that uptick in, in troop surge. General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Lang, uh, so, so what changed? Uh, there, I think there, were, there are a couple things that uh, we were working uh, with and against. Uh, and, and now this is my personal opinion. Uh, this, is, this is not, uh, I'm not saying this was the opinion of the governor or, or, or anyone else. As a matter of fact, when I described my personal opinion, um, it wasn't always accepted. Friday night looked horrible on TV, but Friday night was the night that things began to change, right? We didn't lose the 5th Precinct. Uh, the State Patrol uh, went down there and, and made sure that the 5th Precinct didn't fall. So as I was briefing the senior military leadership of, of the National Guard, that's what I told them. Hey, it doesn't look good on TV, uh, but we have turned the tide, and I'm very confident that on Saturday uh, that we were going to be able to have great success. Because my assessment of the situation is it's not a light switch. It's not on or off, right? It's more like the dimmer. The light's on super bright Thursday night. Our ability to begin dimming that light uh, uh, is what we were, we were working towards, I thought. Because I, I just, look, I'm not a law enforcement professional. But uh, in watching the level of violence that was going on, I just didn't think this was something that was going to go away in, in a couple hours. So, but that's my assessment. The assessment other places is, is that we have continued uh, to have lost 
control of Minneapolis. And so there was a tremendous amount of pressure uh, to ensure that we had every resource available if needed. And also, uh, Saturday morning, uh, there, there begins to be flare-ups in other parts of the country and other parts of the state. So while we were all focused on Minneapolis and St. Paul, we weren't sure if Rochester or Duluth or Mankato or Bemidji was going to be the next Minneapolis. We just we just didn't know. So what what moved us, I I believe, and 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 I'm not trying to speak for the governor, uh, but I believe what the governor's assessment was, uh, while we'd accomplished some things on Friday night, we certainly had not accomplished everything that we needed to accomplish. And we were very concerned about other places in the state. And what happens if we are all so fully, solely focused on Minneapolis that something in Duluth happens? We needed to have that flexibility to immediately respond. And you see that later in the week in Moorhead, where we sent our MP company out to Clay County in support of uh, civil, civil unrest there. So I think it's two things. It's, it's the perception that uh, there still was a lot of work to be done, and we just weren't really comfortable with what the rest of the state was going to, what was going to happen there. And so I believe those two things are what really moved the governor to bring the entire guard on. Senator Lang. And Mr. Chair, and, and sir, you actually answered my next question. My next question was, with the difference in level of violence between Friday night and Saturday night, and what, what, your, what your thoughts were on that, but obviously you, ju you just said that, and... I, I always ask the question, did you accomplish your mission? And, and I can answer that one myself in saying absolutely you did. You did so in a timely manner. You did so professionally, like I said earlier. And uh, again, I, I'm done with questions, but just thank you for the work you did. Thank you for the Minnesota Guard and Air, and Air National Guard for the work that they did, too. So um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator, uh, Senator Howe, you're next on the list. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, General Jensen for, and the entire National Guard for what you did. And, and I say that uh, with uh, my youngest son was in that mix. So, sir, I, I'm going to expound on some of the questions that Senator Lang asked. And uh, so I know that we've got plans that are sitting on the shelf collecting dust. And I know that we make plans immediately as, as the situation dictates. Is this something that was on the shelf, we just dusted off and modified, or was this something we created as, as, it, exp as it transpired? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe, and, and so while you said you had a, your youngest son was there, you also had a son, I believe, up at Camp Ripley getting ready to deploy with uh, two of the 135 infantry as well. And so uh, to answer your question, um, we have, we had a very strong concept of how we do this, but our strong concept is built around two to 700, not 7,000. And so we know that what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to use units to come down, in this case to Arden Hills, to establish what we call reception, staging, onward movement, and integration. And that is, is when you bring a force in this scenario, when we brought a force and before we allowed them to come down on mission, we literally had to put them in the system on state active duty. Uh, so we could pay them, so they would be covered uh, by workman's comp, uh, so we could account for them. We also had to do things like give them their briefings and quick refresher training on rules on the use of force. Uh, we, uh, had to ensure that they had time to plan for their employment from there, that point, that point in. So conceptually, we knew how we were going to do it. Conceptually, we knew what units were going to do it as well. And that's why you see the uh, 347th RSG uh, arrive very early. Uh, you see the uh, 1st Battalion, 151st Field Artillery come with their battalion staff because they already know that they're going to be the tactical commander initially. And so, yeah, the concept's there. Uh, and it's something that uh, while we may not physically rehearse every year, we, we do tabletop exercises uh, on this every year to ensure that key leaders understand how we would go. But, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, you know, if you had told me that 
that this was possible. If, if, if you had set up a training scenario that was this event that we actually accomplished, I would have told you this is completely unrealistic and it would never happen. Stop wasting my time with this. Let's work on something more realistic. Uh, and so, you know, that gets you to the point is sometimes you really don't know what's possible until you're asked to do it. Senator Hall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thanks for laying that out because I, I, I don't think a lot of people understand that. And, and as you have those units that are trained in civil disturbance and, and, and know what they're doing, and that's a rotating basis as far as, because I know that I was one of those units way back in the day when I was an enlisted guy and a young lad. We were trained up in that and actually deployed and used that down in a Austin. What risk were we taking when we elevated that to bring those untrained soldiers, giving them the devices that we gave them, uh, uh, what risk were we taking at that point when we brought them in? And, and, and I know they're great soldiers, they're well trained, they take orders well, but I, I still believe the risk assessment had to be uh, extreme when we did that. General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe, exactly right. As a matter of fact, the first time the governor said to me full mobilization, uh, I was like, whoa, wait a second here, sir. Let's, let's, let's walk through exactly what you just told me. Uh, and I, I laid out exactly that. Uh, and, and we talked about it. And, and uh, what I asked him for was, when we got to this reception station, staging onward movement integration piece, the RSOI piece, I said, I'm gonna need a little bit more time with these soldiers uh, to ensure that they get a little bit more refresher training so we can reduce that risk. Um, because I was, look, my, I had two fears in this entire operation. Fear number one early, Thursday night and Friday night. Um, I, I, I was afraid that one of our soldiers was just gonna disappear. Uh, later, um, when we start bringing in soldiers that while they've had civil disturbance training, it might have been a couple years, I'm more concerned that we're going to have an engagement with a weapon where one of my soldiers or airmen are, are, are going to shoot their weapon. And there are times that they can do that. As a matter of fact, the case that we have uh, shows that, you know, uh, there was a time for us to engage with our weapon and, and we met all the criteria. But those were my two fears early on. Uh, when we were in very small numbers and we were kind of dispersed a little bit, is that, you know, three soldiers standing on a street corner, quickly surrounded by 75 people, uh, that, that's a very dicey proposition there. So we were very concerned with that. Later on, it is, as you laid out, Senator, I was concerned that we, uh, we were going to improperly uh, use a weapon. Senator Hall. Well, well, thank you. And that was, when I, when I heard what units were being that it was a, 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 a all call basically for, for the National Guard. Those were my concerns as it was running into my head too. So I'm, I'm glad you did the analysis on that. Uh, you know, I, I know that when I first got elected, I took, uh, I was brought in to, to the National Guard and kind of described their capabilities and, and the process of bringing them, even though I already knew it, uh, I, th I thought that was a well done thing. I, I don't know if you still do it, but I asked the uh, the commissioner yesterday whether he took that training and whether he had that in the positions as he brought up his. You know, did the governor and the mayors of the first class all get that same opportunity and did they all take that opportunity? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Helm. Um, so we provide that opportunity to uh, mayors of the first class uh, and to all of our newly elected legislators every single, uh, every single election cycle. Uh, and so yes, uh, did they, did, were they provided that opportunity? Uh, absolutely, uh, they were, as were the legislators. 
What we have found is that over the course of time, when you don't have an event like this, people maybe aren't that interested in Guard 101, right? Unless you have a tie to the National Guard. And, and we don't have a great amount of success in people attending those events. And I include legislators, new legislators, as well as uh, emergency managers. What I have found where we are most successful is in what is called uh, AMEM, the Association Minnesota Emergency Managers, which is the professional organization of our professional emergency managers. Uh, they meet twice a year, I believe, or at least we're part of that uh, organization twice uh, a year. And that's really where our inroads take place. Uh, because in part, they are professional emergency managers. They want to know what the resources are. Uh, on the legislator side, uh, you might be interested in it if you're going to be on a committee that has something to do with the National Guard. If you're not on that committee, maybe you're not interested. Maybe we're not, we're not going to go. But uh, I can tell you that uh, even before my time as the Adjutant General, attendance at those type of events are, are, are small. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, but I'm, I, I guess I'm going to ask that again, maybe in a little bit different fashion, uh, and maybe it'll take me all three. Uh, uh, for the folks that were actively involved in this, uh, the governor, I would have to say, probably took that briefing and, and, and that, uh, and I'll take your head shake as, as that's a positive. I won't actually wait for a response. Uh, did the St. Paul Mayor, Mayor Carter, take that same opportunity to get trained up in his staff? General Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe, I, to, to, to be honest with you, I don't recall. I don't recall uh, meeting with either the mayor of uh, St. Paul or Minneapolis uh, and going through this uh, with them. Uh, it, it could have happened with some more junior staff, uh, maybe somebody from the operations team, uh, but I personally was not involved with that. I obviously was personally involved with uh, the governor because it was the first time that he came and visited the agency. We, we, we went, went through that. Uh, but I, I mean, I would have to go back and talk to the whole team to see if somebody recalls meeting with either uh, Mayor Fry or Mayor Carter as it relates to, to the National Guard 101 brief. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and and I, I, I do want to, if you could go back sometime and provide that, I'd appreciate it. Uh, you know, that I don't think a lot of people, and you, you, know, you mentioned that you brought the RSG on board, and a lot of people don't understand what that is, but Bringing this many soldiers on, 7,000 soldiers on board, having been a former log logistician, that takes a lot of logistics. How did you, and, and mobilizing them and, and moving them is one thing, and it's easy to buy buses, it's easy to take all of your equipment and put people in places, but housing them, feeding them is a whole different scenario. And I don't think we had a plan on where you're going to put 7,000 soldiers. And I don't think we had a plan on how you're going to feed 7,000 soldiers because we really, in today's day and age, don't have that capability in-house anymore. And it takes a little bit to get all those uh, food stores to make that happen. So how did you make that happen? General Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, um, you know, what... What gave us the operational depth and the operational flexibility uh, that we showed during this time was our logistics community, uh, both in the Minnesota National Guard as well as the Department of Military Affairs. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention specifically uh, Mr. Dave Lean, who is a one-man logistics cell in the Department of Military Affairs. Um, the great thing about housing soldiers is, as long as it's not raining on them, they're usually fairly happy. And so living at a National Guard armory is not the best place in the world. As a matter of fact, there might have been a couple of pictures you all have seen uh, where it looked downright uncomfortable. Uh, but that was, that was our plan. Uh, the feeding became a, a little bit more challenging because the number of places that we were located uh, and the idea that t 
Today, there might be 400 soldiers at this location. Tomorrow, there's 100. Two days from now, there's 350. That number by location uh, changed. And uh, it was some ingenuity uh, which said, hey, let's call food trucks and see if food trucks are available. They're very mobile. They could literally move with us if we needed to move. Uh, and um, it gave us an ability to uh, be very flexible. Now, I, I say this with great caution sitting in front of you all, but I will tell you the best thing about the governor saying we're going to mobilize the entire National Guard is that efficiency pretty much goes out the window at that point, and it's all about effectiveness. Uh, and so it became a challenge on how we could feed 7,000 soldiers three times a day. Uh, how you could do that, I mean, because look, the, uh, the easiest way is we're just going to issue MREs, but MREs, believe it or not, are incredibly expensive, as, as you know, Senator, are incredibly expensive. Um, and, uh, and so we developed this idea of how could we create a flexible feeding system that could literally move with our soldiers and airmen uh, if needed. And the, and the great byproduct of that is we were able to get to small business, small business that had been struggling for several months because of the uh, COVID-19 restrictions. And in many cases, we were able to give them a little bit more staying power uh, past uh, past that first week in in, in June, so uh, it was it was an it was not part of the plan. Food trucks is not written into the plan, uh, but it worked out worked out very well. Senator Hall, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you stated that in your statement that uh, the National Guard is the last resort. Uh, you know, what date and, and how, you know, I, I know that, can you be kind of specific on the date and the time and how that discussion went when the, when the governor decided that it was time for the last resort and, and bring on all the guardsmen and, and what that trigger point was that says, you know, we've hit that point of last resort, we're bringing everybody on and can you describe that for us? Yeah, I think it, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Senator Howell, um, it, it really, uh, it, it, the basis of the plan starts being developed early Saturday morning. Uh, while, again, uh, my assessment uh, is that uh, we've been mildly successful on Friday. We know we have a lot of work in front of us. Uh, the governor leads a discussion early Saturday morning about what are all of the resources that are available. I want all of the resources. So as it relates to Minnesota National Guard, we talk about what federal resources might be available. Uh, we talk about EMAC in terms of what resources around Minnesota might be uh, available. And we begin talking about, well, how many guardsmen can we actually bring on? What, 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 do, you, what, what do you think? Uh, and at that time, I thought really that the number we could get to based on current deployments, uh, units that are in the final stages of uh, their deployment, uh, soldiers who haven't had all of their training. I thought about 65 to 6,800 was kind of where I thought uh, where it was. And so as we go into uh, early Saturday morning, because we have a phone call with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, on Saturday morning, we start talking about what's what's going to be the, 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 the way ahead uh, as it relates to law enforcement, uh, capability and National Guard or other military uh, capability. Uh, so it's it's shortly after that call, which uh, if in my notes it's very early Saturday morning. I will uh, I will look up the exact time uh, here um, that we commit to. EMAC EMAC is a process where you can gain resources from other states doesn't always have to be the National Guard. It can be other, other resources. Uh, specifically, what we were looking for was military police resources. Again, uh, soldiers and airmen that are more trained for this type of operation than a truck mechanic or a, uh, an infantryman or 
a helicopter pilot or you know any any of those and and so the governor Governor directs me to begin reaching out on EMAC. Now, I know it's time sensitive. Bringing an MP company from Florida is gonna take a couple days. Uh, so I reach out to North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, because we have a pretty good idea what they have as it relates to uh, MPs. And I, I, I reach out to the adjutant generals, I, I wanna say by nine o'clock Saturday morning. I'm, yeah, Saturday morning. Uh, but it becomes apparent to me that that th those states also want to maintain their uh, their MPs, and they're hesitant to push their uh, MPs into Minnesota if what we're beginning to see there is an issue in Fargo or Des Moines or Madison or any any of those cities. Uh, and so that's where then uh, when when I talk to the governor about well you know th this isn't as uh, this isn't going as positively as I thought it initially would be. Uh, that's when he makes the decision early. And I, again, it's it's around nine o'clock Saturday morning that uh, to uh, quote a former uh, military historian that sometimes mass has its own quantity. And so that decision is okay. If I can't get that specific resource, we're just gonna bring in uh, uh, the full force and that will provide uh, what we believe we're gonna need uh, to turn this thing completely around. Well, th thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. I Chair. Was writing a note, and, and, sorry. and thanks for laying that out. I've got one more question here that I'll ask, and, and I, you may have, and I think it's, it's already laid out that, can you, if you had gotten the same mission you got Thursday morning, Tuesday morning. Do you think that we would have been done with this with the limited number of troops done before the end of the week instead of having it ramp up until getting that mission on Thursday morning? If we would have done this on Tuesday or Wednesday, we could have accelerated this and maybe had a little bit more success earlier with, with less disruption and, and, and less uh, activation of, and, and, and disruption of, of all these soldiers' lives and everything else, if we would have just called this a, a, a little bit earlier. General Johnson. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe, um, again, uh, I'm not a law enforcement professional. Uh, I think your question is fair, uh, and, and I think it, it can be debated. Uh, Mr. Chair, and watching the video that you uh, provided this morning, the, the, the one thing that, that, again, reminded me, and again, this, again, not a law enforcement professional, but having studied military history, I know this. Uh, stationary defensive positions that remain stationary and don't move are very vulnerable. Once the mobile field force was applied and put on the ground, on the street, and, and was able to do what they, what they do the best, that's where everything began to turn around. And so it's just not the number, in my military opinion, not law enforcement opinion, the tactics are also a very important part of this as well. And so could, if we had done things differently on, on Tuesday as it relates to numbers, as it relates to tactics, could we avoided some of this? Uh, my unprofessional opinion as it relates to law enforcement is yes. My professional military opinion is yes. Senator Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thought that was my last question. Now that you brought up another question, though. Who brought that mobile tactic to the, to the force? Where did that come from? Was that, a, was that discussed in, in the AMAC? Did, did, did that come from uh, our forces, the military, the National Guard, was that the state police patrol? Who, who brought that idea and who brought that tactic to play? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Howe, uh, I'm personally going to give all the credit it, credit to uh, Colonel Matt Langer from uh, the Minnesota State Patrol, because uh, in many cases, it was his patrolmen uh, that were the majority uh, on that line. They weren't the only ones on that line, uh, but when you look at numbers of law enforcement professionals on the ground, um, my belief is that was Colonel Langer. 
Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. Uh, I, I, credit needs to go where credit's due, and, and uh, I think uh, both the State Patrol and the, and the uh, National Guard need to be commended for, for, the, for the actual deployment and, and, and the emphasis that you, and the outcome that, that you provided us. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Senator Dibble, uh, Senator Dibble, you are next, but I do want to ask a question of the general. Uh, in general, I have no training or background in controlling riots or civil, uh, civil disturbances or anything like that. But when I look at, in, at your testimony where uh, you went initially from a recommendation of 200 and you went to a recommendation of all 700, which were the trained troops that you had at your disposal. And by Saturday morning, uh, it sounded to me like the governor was asking for full mobilization of the National Guard. You went from 700 to over 7,000. And from a very untrained eye, uh, it feels to me like uh, the situation had become dire. It had been really become explosive uh, so that uh, the governor and you and perhaps the commissioner were really concerned that this might get out of hand. You had mentioned, you know, other cities in Minnesota. Uh, can you tell me, General, is, is that what happened? Is that uh, folks were really beginning to get concerned by Saturday morning that this was completely out of hand? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would tell you the group of people that you just mentioned were really concerned Thursday night when 3rd Precinct. And, and you know, um, I, I mentioned Thursday night. You know, the governor might have been concerned earlier than that. I, I just didn't have the opportunity to be in, in conversations with him like what began on Thursday morning. And so uh, it, it wasn't just Friday night into Saturday. Um, you know, my, my personal story is, as I watch, so I, I come into work Thursday morning. I, I know we're going to mobilize the guard at some number. I'm not exactly sure. But we, have, we have an idea. Not exactly sure what the, what the mission's going to be. Like many of us, I watch 3rd Precinct fall Thursday night. I told my chief of staff, uh, Chief, I'm going to go home for a little bit. I got to go get some clothes because we're going to be here a while. And, and I drive back to Apple Valley, and I get about five days' worth of T-shirts and socks and things because I know I'm not going home. Uh, so I can tell you, uh, Mr. Chair, that that feeling uh, for me personally was well before Saturday morning. As I mentioned, I actually start feeling much better Saturday morning because we have held the 5th Precinct. And again, it might have looked really bad on TV, but we had had success. The State Patrol was out in a mobile field force uh, technique and, and, and had success. And so um, you all might have felt a little bit differently and, 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 and certainly the, the, the governor uh, did as well. Um, but I felt much better Saturday morning than I did Thursday night as I was driving home to get five days worth of clothing. General, to go from 700 troops to 7,000 or over 7,000 uh, would it be correct? Is that is that unprecedented, Mr. Chair? That 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 is. I mean, when the governor said full mobilization of the guard, my my belief is the last time that we fully mobilized the Minnesota National Guard was during World War II. Um, the the one of the uh, one of the events that uh, that I mentioned in our in my opening comments, we mobilized 5,600 soldiers. I believe that was 1979. Uh, the Teamster strike, the trucker strike. Um, uh, and so, yeah, 7,123 has never been, do been done before. Thank you, General. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I actually think most of the questions I had were asked and answered by your members, so I appreciate the, the, the questioning that's already occurred. Um, I just, you know, just wanted to to reflect back that, uh, well, first I wanted to say, also say thank you um, to General Jensen and uh, the National Guard uh, for um, doing uh, an incredible job. I mean, what you just described, Mr. Chair, um, mobilizing 7,100 and some individuals who all have, uh, live in every corner of the state and have their own lives and jobs um, is, is, is incredible. And of course, as we can see that 
you know, by the time um, full deployment came in uh, to the time that uh, things had settled down considerably, um, you know, it was what, a little over 24 hours. Um, it was an amazing achievement and, uh, and much appreciated by myself and, and my husband because uh, we were kind of at the, at the far end but uh, kind of at the midst of, of things where we live and certainly um, the businesses and my neighbors and uh, everyone um, in Minneapolis um, needed that sense of, of order restored because it was, it was bad and grim as the video showed. Um, so uh, really, um, uh, you know, I just, uh, the, some of the questions I have about timing, I mean, clearly the line of questioning is what do we know and when do we know it and how quickly were resources called in and, you know, did we know more than we did before um, a sufficient number of resources were called in or not? Really isn't the job of General Jensen to answer. He, um, he was given a, a job and he carried it out uh, with his troops uh, with, with great, great capacity and competency. Um, led by the governor and, and the Department of Public Safety. So um, probably the questions, Mr. Chair, that I'm going to ask um, will be for Commissioner Harrington when he comes up. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, and thank you, General, for being Mr. here. Uh, I really appreciate this hearing. This has been very helpful to understand how the mechanics of, of not that the others haven't, but the mechanics of how this all comes about. Um, I first got interaction with the National Guard years ago when we, um, I actually know what an EMAC is because uh, I wanted Minnesota to be engaged in what happened in Puerto Rico with uh, the Hurricane Maria, and that's probably how we first got word of, of that senator who wanted to send a, an airplane uh, to Puerto Rico. But then we actually had a chance to travel abroad on an unofficial trip uh, recently, and I witnessed myself uh, your leadership uh, when you had to return home early uh, due to the tragedy of the three servicemen that passed uh, in a helicopter accident. So I remember that night. I remember um, your, not just your leadership, but humility of, of going back to your soldiers. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for being in, in this um, particular point in time in Minnesota. I also want to congratulate you with your uh, potential next move. Um, President Trump has actually tapped you to be the next um, director of the National Guard at the federal level and it needs confirmation by the U.S. Senate. So that's admirable in itself. And um, that was just right before you got activated to this mission um, of what we're talking here today. And I think the public needs to know what kind of leader we have in Minnesota, um, regardless of politics, that you have been taking care of us. So thank you for your leadership and everyone that serves with you. Uh, so my question is regarding that federal connection, because there was talk about uh, talking to President Trump about activating uh, the National Guard at, at, at that level. What would that have looked like? Did that happen? Um, can you shine some light? Because there's a lot of um, information about that, but I don't have the facts, and it would be a great place to be in this hearing to have the facts in order of, of can the president order your National Guard at the state level and Trump, no pun intended, um, the governor's act, act, um, activation. What would that look like? Um, why was it not necessary? And I think we, you kind of alluded to some of that. Um, and I'm assuming that's never been done before here in Minnesota, but maybe it's been done in another, in another state. But it would be good to know uh, what that uh, conversation, because uh, I know that the, the governor has been speaking to President Trump with regard to this incident. Thank you. General Jensen. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Friends, and, and, and Senator Dibble as well, thank, thank you for the, for the kind comments, and, and, and ma'am, thank you uh, for those kind comments as, as well. And, and, and so, um, you know, there, there was some pressure, I, I will tell you, uh, on, on the governor to, uh, to bring in federal forces because there was, uh, there had been an announcement that federal forces were available. They were, quote unquote, uh, on alert. Um, and and it, to, to most citizens, uh, there's no difference between the National Guard and the active duty as it relates to uh, domestic operations, but, but there are some significant differences. Uh, for example, uh, as a National Guardsman, because of my dual role as a, as a federal and a state resource, uh, I'm able to do law enforcement operations. 
uh, active duty forces or not. Uh, the uh, posse comitatus uh, prevents them from doing law enforcement. So uh, they're not as effective in, in, a, in a situation uh, like this. Second of all, there is a provision for the president to mobilize a state national guard, but he has to um, uh, utilize the Insurrection Act. Uh, and that is where the president then can force federal uh, troops into a state and federalize uh, the National Guard. The most recent example that I'm familiar with that uh, was uh, during the, uh, the riots following uh, the Rodney King uh, incident in California. But I, I believe it was Governor Wilson at the time. Governor Wilson asked President Bush to do that. So while he uh, implemented the Insurrection Act, it was on behalf of the governor. Uh, I think that historically is when it's been used uh, against governor's wishes were during some of the civil rights uh, issues of the 1960s where governors uh, uh, were not uh, fully in compliant with civil right laws, and so the president elected to mobilize and federalize their National Guard and then turn around and use them to uh, ensure that federal law was being, was being followed. And so in this case, as it relates to Minnesota National Guard, you know, the Insurrection Act was never implemented. We were completely uh, mobilized under the, uh, the order of uh, Governor Walls in accordance with his executive order. Um, and, and again, there was a tremendous amount of pressure at one point to bring federal troops in. Uh, and the, the one good thing about uh, having a former National Guard uh, member as your governor is you don't have to explain why that, in my professional opinion, is a bad idea. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, while we talked about it, I, I don't believe that we ever got far enough down the line where it was seriously considered here in Minnesota. Uh, we have a very robust and capable uh, National Guard, uh, and 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 I I think uh, the governor's decision to bring you know the vast majority of that guard into this this mission spoke that uh, that that yeah we had the right capability to to meet the mission. Senator Franson. Thank you, and just one follow up to because um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we had no tragedies in a midst of an unprecedented event in our state. Thanks for, to all the people that were involved behind the scenes, feeding troops, doing everything. Um, it was amazing and quite frankly, a miracle that, that no one was tragically hurt. So thanks again for keeping the peace, help getting us back on track and, and preserving life. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Friends, and I agree. It's, uh, to me, it's a mir miracle somebody wasn't hurt seriously or killed in, in, during these riots. So thank you, Senator Franzen. Uh, Senator Ingebretson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you, General, for the, your service. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's very clear that you, uh, you absolutely know your mission and, and you have people that stand behind you when you call and, and uh, carry out that mission, and, and I really appreciate Appreciate knowing that, and everybody in the state of Minnesota should appreciate that as well. I, I, I only have a couple questions, and a lot of them have been answered that I had previous. But uh, uh, have you ever seen a situation this chaotic as you witnessed in these riots during the some 30 years in the National Guard? Have you ever witnessed any of that? And my second question would be, during all the, the recent riots that have been going on nationwide, is this one of the biggest and largest call out of uh, our National Guards. That's the General Jensen. Questions I have. Hey, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Engelbertson. Um, certainly, uh, being physically present in an incident, uh, the the you know the only thing that I could draw a comparison to personally would be. Uh, some of the incidents uh, that we dealt with in Iraq when I was deployed in Iraq, uh, but certainly, um, you know, not uh, not something that I personally experienced ever uh, in in the United States. Um, my my first uh, opportunity to to serve during a civil unrest type of mission. I'd done state active duty before, but that has been. 
you know, responding to floods, responding to a, a town after a tornado, those type of things. And 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 while they can, they are very tragic. They are completely different uh, than than this type of event. Uh, and I'm sorry, Senator, could you please repeat the the second part of that? Senator, Ingram. Mr. Chair, thank you, and, and General, thank you. Uh, just um, w was this the largest unit, military unit? deployed so far during these most recent um, unrest in the United States that you know of? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Engelbertson, um, I, yes, when you combine what the National Guard was doing uh, as it relates to COVID-19, we currently have over 30,000 Guardsmen still deployed across the country in support of COVID-19. Uh, and then you have the number of National Guard soldiers and airmen that were deployed as part of civil unrest. And then you add that uh, then to uh, the number of guardsmen that are that are currently deployed overseas. By by far, this has been the largest use of the National Guard at one given time and one given day uh, that I can ever recall. Thank you, uh, Ingerbretson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that. And. That's, uh, that's amazing to me. Uh, you, you did touch on uh, one thing that, that brought back memories of my uh, sheriff days, uh, the Vasi Comitatus, and working with uh, uh, domestic terrorism, rise and poison. I don't know if you remember any of that, uh, if you were around or not. But uh, um, so I, I, you know, I understand some of this stuff and, and uh, what we have to deal with once in a while. But um, we certainly appreciate you, appreciate the, uh, appreciate the governor calling you out uh, when he did. Um, and uh, again, once again, Minnesotans uh, really appreciate, uh, I think, your response. And as Senator uh, said earlier, that nobody was hurt, and, and at least not significantly hurt. And, and that's, that's, to, that's to say an awful lot of everybody that was responding. So thank you so much. Thank you. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, General. Uh, it's an honor to have you before us here. Thank you for your service to our state and country. Uh, I just really have one question. I've been concerned about uh, the guardsmen and uh, the injuries sustained uh, during uh, the time that you protected the Twin Cities. Could you tell us how many injuries there were and what type of injuries, please? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, Senator Hall. Um, so we had a total of 18 injuries to Minnesota Guardsmen, uh, and, and I'll recap them here real quick. None of them were a direct result in civilian to service member interaction. Uh, and, and, and I'll go down by, by day. 29 May, uh, service member reported low back pain while on patrol. 31 May, right hand, thumb, and pointer finger pain and swelling. 31 May, uh, left knee sprain, strain. 31 May, stomach pain, diarrhea, headache, ankle, low back pain. 1 June, severe uh, weakness, exhaustion, uh, heat exhaustion. 1 June, low back pain. 2 June, thumb on left uh, hand, lacerated by knife while opening MRE box. Um, and you chuckle now, there will be one where you'll chuckle a little bit louder maybe. 2 June, service member reported right side, uh, I'm sorry, uh, reported lower abnormal pain. Uh, Chip tooth uh, on 2 June, soldier fell. Uh, 3 June, service member fractured tooth eating a hamburger. 3 June, service member suffered urinary tract infection. Uh, service member was bit on the left index finger while trying to remove a squirrel that had entered a propped open door at the Fairbowl Reserve Center. Fairbowl, uh, yeah. Had to have been an infantryman. Uh, service member, right ankle fracture from fall on military vehicle ladder. Uh, service member report, left pain, hip pain. Uh, service member experienced chest rash. Service member experienced left hip pain. Uh, after sleeping several nights on a concrete floor, service member experienced difficulty breathing. That was later determined to be caused by allergies. And service member was struck in left eye by a, mental, by a metal clamp. Uh, and then uh, following uh, state active duty, we, we COVID-19 COVID tested the entire force, and we had five personnel that tested positive for COVID-19. So that's just a quick rundown of uh, the injuries and, I guess, illness that, that we suffered. Uh, Thank you, that General. Time. 
uh, and that that number of uh, l low casualties of any sort uh, is a credit to you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, General, for, for being here today. I appreciate uh, the time that you're taking to do that. I just had one question. Uh, you, you briefly mentioned that Moorhead also was a, a site that had some, uh, some troops there. Were there any other further sites uh, across the state that required National Guard troops? <laughs> Excuse me, Senator Jensen. Uh, Mr. General Jensen. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator Johnson, uh, there are a couple uh, locations uh, here in the metro area. Uh, we're at the uh, at the shopping mall in Egan, Wall of America, Earl Brown Heritage Center uh, is a location uh, that we supported. Um, but outside of Moorhead, uh, nothing outside of the of the Twin Cities uh, proper. But uh, we were watching, you know, things uh, very closely. You know. Uh, I think it was uh, Faribault where there was, uh, at one point, there was uh, an event that took place. And so um, that's, the, that's the really good things about working with the police department is you, you very quickly get a situational awareness for what's going on as it relates to law enforcement across the state. So we were watching that very closely. Senator Johnson, follow up. Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, General Jensen. Um, I represent Minneapolis, uh, same as Senator Dibble. Uh, as the video said, my luckily most of my area was not hard hit, but I don't think anybody in Minneapolis slept for those five days. And so um, thank you to you and your members for coming in to help. Uh, I also want to congratulate you on your, I don't know if it's a promotion or your potential new job. So thank you and thank you for your service. We do, we do appreciate that. Uh, I have three questions. So um, first one, you mentioned earlier that when the members came in, especially those that weren't part, usually part of um, you know, civil unrest training, that you reviewed use of force and you, you reviewed use of force training. Do you have a use of force policy? And then you also mentioned, um, and I understand the difference between the, um, you know, the National Guard and regular police forces, um, but do you have a policy on duty to intervene and duty to report? And is that more in line with the, you know, the military code of justice or, and how does that work? Senator Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Dizik, uh, so we have a, what's called the standing use of force, uh, and primarily uh, there there are a couple key components to that. First of all, uh, we maintain the inherent right of self-defense, uh, but as it relates to the use of force, it is uh, an escalation uh, scale, and that you can't use excessive force, right? You can you can meet force, but you can't use excessive force. Uh, let me give you, uh, and let me just take a quick minute here to brief the, the one uh, event where we had a soldier that uh, engaged uh, with his, his weapon. It took place uh, on, that, uh, on that first Sunday. Uh, in that scenario, uh, our, our soldier is with law enforcement. Uh, I-35 West in Washington, I believe, is the general uh, area. They had had a car come through at a very high rate of speed, but, the, but, but then it turned and it left. But very quickly after that, the same vehicle came back, or what was perceived to be the same vehicle. It comes towards the checkpoint where the soldier and the police officers are at at a high rate of speed. Uh, the steps that you would follow uh, as, as it relates to the use of force and, and the escalation of force is first is verbal and nonverbal warnings to stop the vehicle. The next step is a non-lethal uh, engagement, which the, uh, the police department utilized. And then the, then the last one is engaging with your weapon. Uh, and that soldier uh, elected to shoot into uh, the engine block of the vehicle and not at uh, the driver. Um, so that would be an example of how you go through those steps. Now they happen incredibly fast. Uh, incredibly fast. Uh, and so that would be uh, an example of how you start with the absolutely lowest level 
which is the verbal, nonverbal, and then ultimately you can escalate to, to the point where you're, where you're pulling the trigger. Uh, the, the key part of that is, uh, and, and this is very important during civil unrest, is that we always have contact with a police force element, that we are not out by ourselves, that we have to have, and it, it doesn't need to be a full squad of police, it, sometimes it's only one police officer, but we have that. And so as it relates to, do we have a duty to report? Um, not to my knowledge, uh, not to my knowledge that we have a duty to report, but because we are linked in and with uh, the police force, uh, you know, they, they, would, they would be there. So I think, uh, you know, anything that needed to be reported uh, probably is being uh, reported to that police officer. But but to my knowledge, we don't have a duty to report. Okay. Senator Deasy. Follow up, thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate that. We, I bring that up because we have had discussions on, on and here on what we do in, in you know, with, with our police force across the state on just the use of force model policy. So I was just curious, so thank you. On the, um, so when you went to activate or mobilize the, the members did the did the governor give you what you needed and the state give you what you needed to achieve success and then kind of as the next step what else could we as legislators do or what do you think that we could do um, again to help you all be better prepared or for you know god forbid if this ever happens again i hope it doesn't but just to be better prepared general johnson Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Dizik, uh, I'm going to answer the, the last one first because I think this is really important and, and again, it gets to the, you know, what's called the militarization of our police force. Um, we, fought an, we fought an information battle for days and days and days and days about, uh, uh, about Minnesota National Guardsmen using excessive force. Um, and, and, and one of the problems is, is that our police force wears, in many cases, the same uniform that the military wears. And so it takes somebody with a very calculated eye to figure out, is that a policeman or is that a, a, a service member? And so what I would like to see is I would like to see our police force uh, not wear military uniforms. When I go back and I look at 1967 and, and the guard response, in 1967, there's absolutely no doubt who the police officers are and who the National Guardsmen, because their uniforms are completely uh, different. There's no blending. Uh, nobody's wearing part of the other person. So uh, what I would ask, one of the things that I would ask you to consider is getting our police force out of a military uniform, at least the military uniform that we're currently wearing, because that would help separate in everybody's eyes who is doing what. Uh, your question, ma'am, as it relates to do we have everything, uh, yeah, ab ab absolutely. I, I felt that, that, that we had uh, everything that we needed to, to be successful. To include, and, and I, I really want to hit this point just very quickly because it's important, uh, community support. Uh, we, we had a, a tremendous outpouring, as we happens a lot, uh, when the guards being, uh, being deployed, when we're being brought back home after deployment, uh, whether we're in Oslo, Minnesota, performing flood duty, uh, or even in this case, uh, the citizens of the state uh, came out once again and uh, supported their their guardsmen, and we're deeply appreciated uh, of that. And I'm deeply appreciative of our employers as well, who, when their guardsmen showed up and said, hey, I've got to go do this mission, said, absolutely, that's more important than what you're doing here. And, uh, and, and it's not that way everywhere, uh, but it's that way here in Minnesota, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. Senator Diesick. Thank you. Uh, General, uh, I have got four more uh, senators that uh, want to ask you questions uh, and we've kept you sitting there for quite some time. Do you need a break? If you do, I would be happy to recess for a few minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I saw the performance from uh, Colonel Langer yesterday, so I'm out to beat his performance. So I'll, I'm not, I'm not going to leave this seat till you're done with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, General. Uh, Senator Kent. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you, General. I want to extend my appreciation to you and the Guard for everything you did um, in my role as one of the caucus leaders in the legislature. I was acting as a liaison between um, our members and the MAC, mostly, but others uh, in trying to help coordinate some of the concerns and the messages and the information that was coming up through the community. I specifically remember um, getting uh, a request from Senator Jeff Hayden from uh, Abbott Northwestern and Children's and they were really concerned about their vulnerability, um, not just for protecting the, the, the uh, healthcare workers and the patients, but also because of potential damage that could be done to that facility and the community that would have been widespread. And it happened that I think it was the next day I drove into Minneapolis to attend um, a gathering there with some other folks, and I, we drove right by it, and the guard was there, and it was so reassuring to see that, that that was working, you know, it was, it, it, the process was working the way it was supposed to. So I just, I share that as a, as a personal experience and having sat through a lot of late night, early morning situation updates, I just know um, the coordination was phenomenal. And um, in, in really a pretty short amount of time, um, it, it's hard to remember thinking back on it, but this all started in Minneapolis and Minnesota. And so other communities were able to learn from our experience and, and, and predict better um, how things could go and how they could be better prepared. But we were, we were on the leading edge of this. And so, again, just um, great appreciation. Um, a couple of questions I appreciate, um, particularly Senator Lang's uh, line of questioning, and, and that I think was very helpful in understanding um, uh, the work that was done and the response. Um, it gave me a couple of other questions I wanted to bring up. Um, you talked about um, the process of mobilizing and the timelines for the different types of groups. Um, and you alluded to the, the, the time that is required to get everybody up and running. Could you just provide a few more details about why we can't just flip a switch and get a, hundreds and thousands of people across the state? General Jensen. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Kemp. Uh, primarily, and I hate to use this term. This is a horrible term. I, I, I grind my teeth when people use this term, but I'm going to use this term. I have a part-time force that's geographically separated across the entire state of Minnesota and the upper Midwest. I Believe it or not, I had a soldier who lived in Wichita, Kansas, report to duty. I had a soldier who lived in uh, Columbus, Georgia, who reported to duty. Uh, and so the vast majority, obviously, are, are here in Minnesota, but, but we, are, we are a geographically separated uh, force. Uh, our equipment is not stored at home. Our equipment stored at the, the National Guard facility that you're assigned to. Um, and while getting a hold of soldiers is much easier now that we have cell phones than back in the old days with landlines, it, it just physically takes time to call people uh, and notify them and tell them what your expectation is as it relates to reporting and where to report and how long are you going to how long do you need to be prepared to report to? So it is, it, it's, a, it's a long process. Uh, and to, because what we, what we don't want is we don't want anybody, you know, pretending that, uh, you know, they're the fire department or the state patrol and just go screaming down the interstate at 106 miles an hour because they think that, you know, that's, that's what our expectation is. We want everybody to move deliberately and safely to their, to their point of uh, reporting and then and then move move out uh, move out from there and it it takes time logistically uh, for example uh, in this case uh, we uh, based on, off of a risk assessment we issued weapons to soldiers so we had to take that time to ensure that they were properly issued and and other special equipment uh, and so it is uh, it is designed to be slow uh, because if it was designed to be fast everything that we would need would reside in our basement to include our weapon. Uh, and we could just self-deploy like law enforcement's able to do because you know they, they literally are first responders. Uh, we're not, and, and, and so uh, we, we are a much more deliberate force. And Mr. Chair? Senator Kent. Thank you. Um, and just to be clear here, um, who is the commander in chief of the Minnesota National Guard? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kent, that would be the governor, uh, Governor Walz. Thank you. And um, Mr. Chair? Senator Kent. Um, did the governor ever second guess uh, your expertise in this whole process? 
General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kent, uh, not once. Senator Kent. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one final question. Um, were you able to begin uh, preparations prior to um, receiving the formal written orders that you got? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, Senator Kent, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, I'm going to say it one more time, but I don't think it can be said enough. Thank you to you and for all your, uh, the whole National Guard. I think, again, it can't be said enough, uh, the great work that you did. So, um, And Senator Kent uh, basically kind of brought up the same point here, but um, I didn't serve, but my father did, and he was very active in the VFW, and I grew up around... Uh, many military people, and one of their biggest complaints that I have always remembered um, since I've been elected was that too often they believed bureaucrats and elected officials got in the way of the military and, and their job. And uh, just struck, I remember in one of your press conferences that you had mentioned that your orders had uh, lacked clarity, which maybe uh, didn't allow you to be as effective um, as you might have been early on. And you made a, I didn't write it down, at, at, but your comment earlier that maybe your opinion wasn't always uh, listened to, I don't remember exactly how you stated it, but I just wanna um, have you let us know, you kind of answered it already, but when it actually came down to giving orders to your forces, was your, you know, we heard earlier, you're being uh, promoted yet again because of your expertise and your knowledge. Um, were you allowed to give the orders to your troops that you felt were necessary? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Rarick, um, I'm, I'm reminded that in some people's eyes, I am part of the bureaucracy as well, right? Um, but yes, um, I, I felt that, that I had the governor's confidence to lean forward when I felt like I needed to lean forward. Uh, you know, the, the, the governor's style of leadership, and I'm just going to talk as it relates to Commissioner Harrington, Colonel Langer, and I, because uh, we spent a tremendous amount of time on the phone and, and, and physically together, was Governor Walls was never going to tell us how to do something. What he told us to do was what his expectation is. My expectation is we're going to achieve this. Now go and do it. And, 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 and any time you have an opportunity to work in that environment, uh, it's very empowering. And, and I feel like as uh, my leadership style is the same way. Uh, I was not going to dictate to my subordinate commanders how they accomplished the mission, but I wanted to make sure that they understood what the mission was and what mission success looked like. Senator Rarick. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you. And I, I know uh, my dad and all the people he served with appreciate that. Thank you. Senator Yuzinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and also thank you, General Jensen. Uh, I have not near the uh, military experience you do, uh, but I did serve four years in the military and the Navy, and that was probably the best thing that I ever did in my life. And I would recommend every constituent, student, person have some form of that training because it definitely uh, gives you the personal responsibility, the professionalism. Uh, I think it's a great thing for everything to do. So thank you again for that. Uh, also, Colonel Langer, uh, Commissioner Harrington, for all your support, what was done. Uh, and Senator Dietz kind of got that question. Um, you know, looking, my constituents want to know, how do we prevent this from happening again? What's our best thing and, and how are you working to uh, work on that. When I was in the military, I was an air intercept controller, an anti-submarine air controller, and we would have strike missions or uh, uh, emergency low visibility approach or something like that. We'd always debrief of you know what happened right, what ha went wrong, how can you improve, and, and I guess uh, that's what I think the constituents of Minnesota want to know is what would we learn from this, how can we respond better, and one of the things that I noticed on the news clips and things we did is, is the number of people that respond seem to definitely diminish what happened. So a large show of force, I think, diminished that. And, and I think in the first two days, we didn't see that. So to finally to get the National Guard to come in and show those number of force, I think we definitely saw that 
go down and, and what happens. So uh, just touch a little bit on, on what we're going to learn from this, how you're going to work with us as legislators and the governor to make sure something like this doesn't happen again and how we, how we could respond faster. Maybe, and maybe it's through our local law enforcement. Uh, I know, again, I, the State Patrol did a phenomenal job when they came in. You saw that news clip of how they broke up that demonstration in half right away and stopped that. But I, I think we want to learn from this so that if something un ever happen like this again, which I, I hope it never does, but I know watching what happens in, in the timeline you provided, it, it probably will at some point. So how can we learn from this? What are you doing uh, so that we know our residents and our constituents in our districts know that this scare will never happen again, or if it does, that we, we respond better? General Jensen. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Jasinski, I, I, I'm duty bound to say this since you've identified yourself as a Navy veteran, go Army, beat Navy. Please Here don't hold go, that against Senator. me. Uh, General Jensen. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry the Chief of Staff of the Army requires me to say that. Uh, but seriously, Senator, uh, you, I mean, you bring up great points. Uh, there are certainly things that need to change that are outside of my purview, right? And, and I'm not here to, to address those. Let me talk a little bit about my organization and what I, what I see. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you really don't know what's possible until you're asked to do it, and then you go and do it. Uh, this has really opened up my eyes about what are our true capabilities. Um, so while now we know what is truly possible, uh, not that we ever want to do this again. We, we certainly don't want to do this again. Um, but if we're a year from now, uh, I'll give you the exact example. As things started warming up in other states, a couple adjutants general called me and they asked this question. Hey, Knowing what you know now, what would you do different? And I said, if they ask for 500, bring 1,000. If they ask for 1,000, bring 2,000. Uh, because your point's exactly right. What you want to do is ensure that, uh, that violence uh, is held to the bare minimum. Uh, and, and, and that was my initial guidance to, um, to my fellow adjutants general. Understanding you have to have a mission, you have to have tasks. Uh, showing up just to show up sometimes uh, is detrimental uh, as well. But as it relates to responding uh, better, responding uh, faster, um, I, I don't know that we could, I don't know that I could do that short of just saying, instead of 200 on day one, saying, hey, let's just bring 2,000. Uh, th that certainly gets, uh, gets that. But I think we've all learned, because we've seen this now, uh, you know, the, the, the last time that we've had true civil disturbance to this level, uh, you know, really I think is 1967 and most of us are either not born yet or so young you don't, you don't remember that. And so now we have this as a shared experience as leaders, governmental leaders, military leaders, law enforcement leaders. Uh, because we've had this shared experience, there are things that I think come out, one, uh, the establishment of the MAC and that unified command where Every law enforcement agency is together, working through the priorities, communicating to one another, uh, understanding where the priority is and where the resources come together. It's, an, it's a remarkably powerful organization. Uh, I saw something similar to it during Super Bowl 52 and then seeing this. Uh, and that, and that it's not about Minneapolis is doing their thing and St. Paul's doing their thing. Uh, because they're connected cities, they need to be doing it together. Because what is going on in one city is going to affect the other, as well as our other outlying cities. It's just not Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's Plymouth. It's Woodbury. It's Apple Valley, where I live. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. But having that unified command where all of the, the law enforcement experts can come together and, and do this together, I think builds to a quicker success, uh, uh, quite honestly. Um, and you know, I will I will tell you that to my personal experience in our current state EOC is that it is a substandard facility for a metropolitan area of this size, uh, where it's located. 
is completely unsafe. Uh, you know, and I'm telling you that because it was my airmen that were down there armed protecting that facility. Uh, it it uh, it might have had a utility in its current configuration at one time, uh, but I believe that the way that technology has changed, um, the way that we need to collaborate, and the way that we need to ensure security of key individuals, uh, that a better location is available. And so uh, if you're asking me what could we do differently, uh, I will tell you a state EOC uh, would go a long ways to helping us drive towards what we call unity of command and unity of effort. That's where I saw the true progress take place, is when we were able to unite everybody together and work towards not individual problems, but the problem set uh, in, in, in its entirety. And we were able to add depth and we were able to begin anticipation, and we'll be able, to, and we were able to begin contingency planning. If this happens, we're going to be able to do this. Oh, we don't have a resource. Okay, let's find a resource to do that. And it got us out of what I call crisis action planning into true planning. And once you get into planning, you're always going to be more successful. When we were in crisis action mode, and you know we were just chasing it, chasing it, chasing it. Uh, my fear was that this was going to go on for a while. But once we actually got into the planning stage and we were able to start looking at initially, hey, 12 hours ahead, and then later we were able to look out 24 hours, and then a little bit, you know, a day or two later, we were able to look out three days. It just uh, uh, made us so much more successful, uh, so much more effective, and ultimately so much more efficient. Senator uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, once again, thank you, General uh, Jensen. Uh, I think when most people watched on the news when the State Patrol came in and the National Guard came in force, it was a game changer. And I don't think I've ever heard so many people be so happy to see that come in and, and what it did for our state. So thank you again for all your service. Thank you, Senator. General, uh, uh, with respect to your state DOC, let me introduce you to the chairman of the Capital Investment Committee, Senator Senjum. <laughs> I think I've been set up. <laughs> right under the bus, Senator. <laughs> well, as we all have said, uh, General Jensen, thanks for being here today. And thank you for uh, your service, uh, your guardman service. Uh, they have made Minnesota proud uh, once again, and they, uh, as not infrequently, uh, as they show up in floods and ever their incidents across Minnesota, uh, the the work that you have done here, as we have all have said, is uh, is remarkable, and uh, I think we'll all be forever proud of of, of, of your soldiers, your airmen, and, and certainly yourself as a as a commander of our organization. So I just have a couple of questions. Uh, one of them, actually, I was going to get into the incident command, the emergency uh, operations center, and things like that. And I'll, I, I will get there. But maybe I, I just want to start with, uh, and and this can be a rather quick question if it's not the case. But uh, my understanding was, perhaps from the media, that uh, in addition to supporting law enforcement, you were also supporting fire. And I'm not sure if that was in back of the law enforcement or whatever. But with with your relationship to the uh, fire suppression and the support of the firefighters uh, uh, was that a uh, was that a a, a a activity with with the law enforcement or were you I, I got the impression sometimes honestly it was the fire department and the National Guard that were taking care of those situations uh, and the law enforcement people were out doing other things uh, is was that the case or was it uh, uh, were you working with law enforcement in terms of protecting firefighters so they could do their work General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Sensum, it's good to see you again, sir. Um, yes, and so uh, fire department in Minneapolis and St. Paul, emergency services, ambulance service uh, as well. Uh, we supported uh, that, that effort as well. And what, that, what we did is we provided them uh, escort security. So as they moved from the fire station to a fire, well, we would help secure them. And then once they were on scene uh, fighting that fire, responding to that fire, or responding to a medical emergency, we helped secure that, that, that small area where they were operating in. And what that does and is 
Um, it relieves the police department of those missions so those police officers can go do the law enforcement mission. Uh, very early on, Minneapolis asked us to pick that up. Uh, I wanna say Thursday, uh, Thursday evening, the 20, um, 29th or 28th, um, we picked up that mission. And, and the one thing I told the governor once we got that mission was, sir, I'm going to do this mission until Minneapolis tells us not to do it anymore. Because I thought that that was absolutely providing and supporting the security uh, environment of Minneapolis and then, and then later St. Paul. As, as we all saw and as we all experienced, uh, the inability of the fire department to get to the fires to do the job that they wanted to do uh, and that we expect them to do was limited uh, by by some of the demonstrators and, and protesters. And and quite honestly, when they're working a fire, they are so vulnerable because they are all focused on the fire. They're all focused on their actions on that fire, uh, and they're incredibly vulnerable. And so, uh, our our ability to support that effort uh, is is one that I'm very proud of. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, maybe just to shift the gears a little bit then, uh, and, and talking about the emergency operating center and and, uh, and incident command and, and, and most particular communications, I've just been sitting here wondering, are, are you on the 800 megahertz, the, the armor system and so on, just as well as the other, the other law enforcement uh, and fire agencies? General Jensen. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Senjum, uh, we, we have that capability. Uh, we had to gain some additional capability during this operation based on the, the number of people that we had uh, mobilized in support of this. And so, yes, we do uh, have a, uh, a level of 800 megahertz radios primarily for that civil disturbance trained unit. So that's that, that those units that make up those 700 soldiers, yes. Okay. And then last, uh, uh, you know, I think if, if we never knew it, uh, Having at your disposal 7,000 guardsmen to, to come out uh, at, a, at a time of crisis is, is, is terribly important, and I don't think we should soon forget this. Uh, perhaps other states don't have this capability uh, based on volunteerism and things like that. Uh, you don't have to maybe necessarily get into deep answers today, but uh, how do we sustain this going forward? Are there things the legislature might be considering? Uh, in terms of incentives or, or, or the like to you know, maintain this uh, cadre of citizen soldiers that are willing to give other time and their life to, to, uh, to come forward at times like this, not only certainly domestically, but even on foreign soil. Uh, I don't know if you have any just initial comments, but uh, I think this is probably something that uh, we should never forget, and that is the importance of our of our National Guard and our citizen soldiers to the to the safety and the welfare of our state. Uh, and if you have any immediate comments, that's fine. If you don't, why, I think in, in writing uh, later on, why, that would be either good for either you or, or your successor, so. <laughs> General Jensen. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Senjum, uh, thanks for asking that question. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the Minnesota National Guard uh, is a force of about 13,000 soldiers and airmen. Uh, not all of them are qualified. Uh, you know, they're awaiting basic training or they're advanced individual training. And so there's a certain number that aren't available for a mission like this. Uh, and then we have soldiers and airmen that are deployed, getting ready to deploy. But what allowed us to bring 7,100 soldiers on duty is the fact that the Minnesota National Guard is 115% strength of our authorized strength. And how are we 115% of our authorized strength? It's a couple things. It's, it's the community spirit that I believe that we have here in Minnesota. It's the long tradition that we have of, of, of supporting the guard that we have here. But it's also things like the state tuition assistance that is provided by our legislators uh, that helps uh, pay for college uh, that can be a motivator for a young man or a young woman to join college. My personal experience in 1982, I joined the Iowa National Guard specifically for two reasons. One, I'm looking for a little adventure, and number two, I'm looking for a way to pay college. Uh, and uh, that is as important today as it was in 1982. Um, I believe what we really sell in the Guard is opportunity. It's not going to happen to everybody, but you can enlist as an E1 private, the lowest rank in the formation, and someday grow up and be the adjutant general. 
Doesn't happen to everybody, but it does happen to people, uh, to some people. You get the opportunity uh, to help your community out, uh, whether that is uh, COVID-19 testing, whether that is flood relief duty. Uh, you get an opportunity to help your nation out uh, through deployments. You get an opportunity to, to do a lot of things, meet a lot of people. Uh, and, and I think that, that we need to continue with that spirit of, of incentivizing our young men and women to continue to serve in our Minnesota National Guard. Because as I mentioned earlier, there is no agency that is as flexible and as versatile as our agency. Whether it is going on a federal mission overseas, supporting an operation in Minnesota, or in many cases, and we forget about this, we have, uh, we have supported uh, domestic operations throughout the country, whether it's wildfires uh, in California, whether that's uh, uh, support to uh, Puerto Rico after hurricanes there. And so, um, you know, we have an incredibly dynamic, incredibly professional force, and we want to we maintain that uh, because it adds value to our community. Thank you. And, uh, well, thank you, General. Uh, uh, Senator Senior. General, the Guard has a history in the Capital Investment Committee going back to Julian Plowman, and, uh, and uh, she taught me a lot about the Guard and how important it is. I know that uh, you and her are acquaintances and, uh, and former committee administrator, by the way, and, uh, and uh, a person that's on the Guard journey, if you will. So, uh, again, thank you. We have our respect and admiration, and I think you're going to see that reflected in the Capital Investment Committee bill of 2020. <laughs> thank you, sir. Senator Limmer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, I'd be remiss if I didn't also add to uh, the appreciation we have for the Guard, as well as your personal service. We thank you for your personal devotion and commitment, um, especially those who serve uh, as kind of the lifers of our military. We greatly appreciate that. Um, I wanted to bring our questions back to the subject of the day, and that was the reaction of the National Guard uh, during uh, the riots uh, that they were called into. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, uh, was there any credible threats against the National Guard during those days? General Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Lamer, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and so I'll talk about, about, I'll talk about two of them. Uh, th that were very specific threats, and then I will talk about also what we are seeing and what we are what we were uh, I experiencing. Um, early on the 28th, early early afternoon, as we had already begun movement of soldiers uh, through the FBI, uh, we received a notification of a directed threat against the Minnesota National Guard uh, that that talked about shooting guardsmen in Minneapolis. And I took that, uh, I took that FBI uh, report and I sent it to the Commissioner Harrington and I sent it to Governor Walz's Chief of Staff, Chris Schmitter. And, and my, my comments to him was, I consider this a credible threat. Uh, it came from the FBI. The FBI in the report called it a credible threat. And as a result, my recommendation to the governor is that we arm the National Guard. Previously, what my approach was going to be, it was going to be mission, based on mission by mission. That if your mission was going to put you in an area where we, we might think that you might uh, be physically uh, at risk, we, we were going to arm you. Or if the local police force asks us to be armed. Uh, but on, after receiving that report from the FBI, I asked from the governor to blanketly arm the guard. Uh, because while it said Minneapolis, I wasn't so sure that that's necessarily where it possibly could happen. Later on, a couple days later, we get reports that there has been a threat against the National Guard for um, IEDs, uh, improvised explosive device. Uh, we're moving through the Twin Cities uh, in our military convoys. Uh, we begin noticing uh, that, that people are begin following us. Uh, we're not exactly sure if it's just people that are curious about, hey, what's the guard doing? Oh, look at those big trucks, or if there's some type of nefarious uh, approach to this. 
But when we combine uh, what we what we are seeing on the ground, and then with this report that there is a threat against the guard as it relates to IEDs or improvised explosive devices, which are can be uh, targeted towards individuals, but usually targeted towards vehicles, uh, we were very concerned uh, about our safety. And then. You know, my headquarters building is right there, you know, right here at the state capitol, right on the compound, what we call Cedar Street Armory. Uh, we, could, we could see the surveillance that was taking place uh, of that facility, and we were getting reports of other uh, armories uh, of uh, being, being surveilled. And uh, so we were very concerned uh, on, 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 on the threat that was being uh, communicated and projected uh, against the against the guard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator when you informed the governor um, or sought permission to arm your personnel, did the governor comply with that request? General Jensen, Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, um, immediately. Uh, both Commissioner Harrington and, and the governor's chief of staff responded very, very quickly. First, Commissioner Harrington said, I support uh, General Jensen's re uh, uh, request. And, and the chief of staff came, came back very, very quickly and, and said the governor's approved. Uh, Mr. Limmer. Chairman, uh, I don't think uh, a lot of people realize the organization of the protesters. Uh, you began to see it on a national scale. The pattern uh, was very similar to what was going on in the Twin Cities area. And um, uh, I was rather surprised that within 24 to 48 hours, uh, out of literally nothing, there were agitators and organizers and perhaps even third parties that wanted to jump into the fray and steer demonstrators or motivate them, incite them into more than just a peaceful demonstration. But they had something far more in, in mind. Um, but now hearing that there were others, apart from the demonstrations, watching armories, that puts a whole different light on the threat that was on this area. Um, do you know if this is an ongoing uh, organization of threat that we have to be concerned about in the near future? Uh, whether there's a demonstration or not? Could, there, could this lead to isolated incidences that could be a threat to other authority uh, figures as well as buildings such as our Capitol? General Jensen. Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, there was a physical threat there was an information threat and there was a cyber threat. Uh, most certainly, uh, as I described, there was a physical threat. Um, uh, there, was a, there was a physical threat that was expressly exp uh, laid out against me. Um, there was an information threat. Look, I, uh, we've spent a lot of time in the military looking at this. There are, there are enemies of our nation that use information platforms to perpetuate lies, uh, perpetuate uh, misinformation, and to continue to drag up stories and use propaganda against the city of Minneapolis, the city of St. Paul, the state of Minnesota, the Minnesota National Guard, every police agency that we have here, and every single leader uh, that, that could be brought up. Most certainly. Uh, how do I know that? No matter how many times, if you, if you remember, uh, I first saw it on, on Twitter. I think it was on many other uh, social platforms. Uh, there, there's a group of people sitting on their front porch. A police element comes in, uh, shoots them with some marking rounds, forces them to go in. Somehow, the Minnesota National Guard's name gets associated with that, even though it's clearly not a military person, all you have to do is look at the uniform. We could not defeat that story. That story had legs day after day after day, and it just moved from, from site to site to site. Uh, and and, and it, 
an important part of our ability to tell the story was our public affairs operation and trying to use our public affairs to help get the truth uh, out. Great capability that the Guard has. Um, I, I, will just, I will just talk about what it relates to the Minnesota National Guard. We saw an increase on cyber attacks on, on our platforms. Uh, we, we, had, we had to consciously uh, take measures uh, as it relates uh, to the cybersecurity of our, uh, of our systems here. Um, and so it is no doubt in my mind, was, was there some type A orchestration of the physical information cyber threats uh, in Minnesota? Absolutely. Was every org organization that was involved in those organized? No, some of them are very disorganized. Uh, but it is uh, very apparent to me that the enemies of this nation, for a period of time, were very focused on Minnesota and very focused on Minneapolis and St. Paul. Mr. Chairman, Mr. when I hear an IED being a threat during a demonstration, um, I imagine a war zone. I don't imagine a street in Minnesota, uh, regardless of what triggered uh, the demonstrations. Um, even during the uh, heyday of the uh, 1960s and 70s anti-war movement, you did hear of explosions, you did hear of bombs, you did hear of the weather under, underground, uh, Elements of the new left uh, were active, and some of them were in the business of making bombs, focused on police stations and individual targeting of police officers. I really hope we're not entering those days again. Uh, I can only thank heaven for not having that go off uh, in those days uh, in the later part of May, when, uh, when we were experiencing that type of activity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Dibble. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I really don't want to respond to Senator Lenberg other than to say that um, you know, he invoked the, the new left of the days of the weather underground. I, we well, need to mention that the the most amount of political violence we've seen in this in this country uh, recent years is coming from um, right wing groups. So we just need to deal with facts here. Uh, the most amount of violence and the most number of injuries have been at the hands of right wing extremists in the last uh, few years. Um, Senator uh, Senjum asked the, the question yesterday, and Senator Jasinski asked the, I don't have a question, I just have a statement here. Um, it asked the question today, um, what, uh, what do we need to do? How will we make sure that this will never happen again? And then it was followed by uh, pronouncements that, you know, tremendous shows of force from the police are the ways, and, and National Guard are, are ways to make sure um, that this never happens again. Um, I also want to know how to make sure something like we experienced in this last month will never happen again. Um, why was there civil unrest? Why was there a breakdown in the social contract? Um, why, uh, why were the Minneapolis police um, uh, uh, experiencing such a low level of trust so as to be highly ineffective in many instances? And, in uh, trying to quell and deal with what was going on. Um, you know, what is at the root cause uh, of civil unrest? And uh, we're now on the third of, uh, of what will be five or six four-hour hearings, four-hour-plus hearings. And I think um, unpacking these questions and really uh, digging in and learning about um, what the citizens of this state are feeling and experiencing and asking us for would be a tremendous use of 20 plus hours of our time. Uh, and we're not doing that. And I think that's a shame. Uh, Mr. Chair, you've said that's not the purview and the jurisdiction of these committees. Um, 
I don't think that's the point. The point is, last I checked, you have a Republican majority, a Republican majority leader. You have a decision as a caucus on how we're going to invest over 20 hours of our time. Um, and, uh, uh, and we've heard a lot of pronouncements about how there haven't been big enough shows of force in a timely enough fashion and failures of leadership. I would, gosh, it would be great to, to really uh, understand um, why people were so upset to, to, to feel pushed to the point of desperation uh, and why there was rioting and looting and, and, and what happened. Both, both why it happened, you know, the murder of, of George Floyd uh, wasn't in a vacuum. Um, in terms of the larger context of racial division and mistreatment and maltreatment of black people and other people, but also um, how, in fact, uh, law enforcement in its professional judgment and otherwise um, can both escalate and de-escalate particular circumstances and dynamics. That would be an interesting conversation. Um, but I feel like we spent a lot of time um, uh, kind of flogging a dead horse here, not really getting to any information that's actually interesting to what the people of Minnesota really want us to talk about, which is why, is there, why are there so many people who feel fundamentally disrespected, who feel like they're discriminated against, who feel like they're treated poorly by law enforcement, um, who, who feel like um, there are instances in which people of their community, of our community, of the Minnesota family who, who are killed in our name by, by our own government. And we're not doing that. And Mr. Chair, I think that's just a shame. Just very quick response. Uh, all of those issues that Senator Dibble just raised, uh, I believe are important issues. Uh, nevertheless, they are not the topic of these uh, hearings. And uh, if we have individual senators who uh, don't believe the topic that we are uh, exploring throughout the course of these hearings, uh, I can't help that. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, it is very important that we delve into uh, the riots that occurred in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and other places, and the damage uh, that has, has occurred to people's lives and their businesses. Uh, I think it's important that we explore uh, uh, issues that do not involve legal civil demonstrations, but rather involve criminal activity, including arson and looting uh, and physical violence uh, being directed to our law enforcement and to our National Guardsmen. I think there's all important issues that uh, uh, we are properly as a Senate committee addressing. General Jensen, <clears throat> uh, rarely have I seen a uh, testifier or a witness or a guest uh, come into a committee and, and hold our attention uh, uh, like you have today. And I want you to understand this is a joint committee, so it's two different committees joined for the purposes of uh, asking you questions. You have been very gracious with your time. Uh, I personally have learned a lot. And uh, on behalf of the committee, I want to express our appreciation uh, with uh, how gracious you were with your time. And uh, uh, I, I would welcome you back anytime, General Jensen, and best of luck in the future. Uh, go ahead, General Jensen. No, I was just going to, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. And Chair Limmer, as, as well, to, to your committee that I know is represented here as well. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come in and, and tell the story of, uh, of our great Minnesota National Guard uh, for, for, for a little bit. Uh, you know, we are, we're incredibly proud of what was accomplished, uh, Senator Dibble. We, we also agree that that's just part of the work that needs to be done. There's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done in the state of Minnesota, and, and, and we want to be a part of that work as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, General. Uh, members, w with that, we are going to uh, take a 30-minute uh, uh, lunch break. So we are, for 30 minutes, we're in recess. <laughs>